Fresh Bait by Corn Connick. Leonard pushed his face firmly into the crease of his elbow as another scathing blast of frigid air blew through the valley. The snow piled up at his feet as he stumbled up the small incline, struggling to keep his balance as the biting cold permeated his winter jacket. Shivering, he turned, bearing his back to the icy downpour and staring across the barren fields of white before him. At the very crest of the blizzard, a single tent was cartwheeling across the snow, leaving a tiny trail of dents as each of its jagged ends hit the ground. Leonard prayed no one had been inside as he watched it disappear from sight, disintegrating into torn scraps of material. Tracing the tent's path, he spotted a patch of level ground, where a collection of scattered debris was strewn. Hastily, he skidded back down the incline and ran towards it, clutching his hood as it flapped mercilessly in the wind. Two ends of torn wire swayed back and forth at the edges of the area, where a tent had been nailed to the ground. Besides them was a piece of dark fabric, and then its pulse quickened as he saw it was the torn remains of a winter coat collar. Reluctantly, he kneeled and scooped it up with his palm, wiping the blurriness from his eyes with the back of his own gloved hand. Jeffreys was scribbled on the frost-smeared label. Leonard rolled the name back and forth through his head as he stared at the familiar writing. Jake Jeffries, the one who had convinced him the oncoming blizzard was just a minor weather spike. The rotten no-good bastard that had talked him and his wife into joining him on this damn trip. He tossed the collar aside and with moderate difficulty pushed himself back into a standing position. The last tent of a half a dozen the trip had begun with flew into the air as he came near it, its orange exterior fading into a solemn grey as it vanished into the haze. Leonard dropped to his knees once more as he rummaged through the snow, finding only empty flasks, plastic food packaging, and used waste bags. No flare gun, no emergency supplies, and no sign of any of the other hikers. No sign of... Rachel? Leonard desperately called out. Rachel, can you hear me? It was answered with another intense blast of cold to the face, this time without the shield of his arm to nullify the effect. He coughed and hugged his chest, gritting his teeth to stop them from chattering together. Already he had lost the feeling in his toes. The cold was undoubtedly getting to him, and yet there was nothing he could do. Dozens of questions raced through his brain as he felt his final moments drawing. Where were all the others? Had they already succumbed to the conditions? Was he the last one left? The thought of his wife of so many years dying cold and alone was almost enough to force a tear from his wind-stamped face. And then, like a mirage, he saw it. An animal corpse in the snow. With the last of his energy, Leonard sprinted at the thing, who was both grateful and dumbfounded, grateful of whatever powers that be saw him fit to live another day and dumbfounded that such a creature could have made it so far into the oblivion. The nearest wildlife should have been miles away, and yet, here lay some sizable beast whose basic survival instinct must have somehow malfunctioned, leading it all the way to certain doom. From the way only its lower half was covered in snow, Leonard reckoned it must have perished fairly recently. As close as it was to the tattered remains of camp, he was sure he would have seen it before. And as for what it was, Leonard didn't have the slightest clue. He was sure it was just his frozen mind, but as he shuffled to where he assumed its stomach would be, he noticed it didn't seem to match the characteristics of any animal he knew of. Its skin was dark and furry like a bear's, but its appendages were thin and elongated, ending in shattered, deformed hooves. Welts of flesh collected on its back, like purplish bruises and several long, thin scars ran down the length of its body. Perhaps it wasn't the cold that led to this thing's demise, and had thought to himself, but rather some apex predator that had chased it until it could go no further. He shuddered at the thought of such a beast roaming through the cold, teeth bared looking for its next victim. The ambiguity of the creature remained as Leonard took out a pocket knife and slit open its coarse belly. Warm, slimy innards spilled out, resembling no kind of anatomy he'd seen before. There was no stomach, intestines, liver, spleen, everything just looked like one big pile of rotten pinkish mush, like melted ice cream. It stuck to Leonard's clothes as he shoveled it onto the snow 
distracting him from the cold if only to violate his senses in an equally unpleasant manner. Gore had never much bothered him before, but now he felt sick to his stomach. Before long, there was a big enough hole for him to crawl into. It was most likely going to be the foulest, most repugnant thing he had ever done, but it was still more preferable than succumbing to hypothermia. Leonard stood up and gazed out at the valley one last time, reaffirming its emptiness before taking a deep breath and climbing into the carcass. Jagged ends of bones pressed into the surface of his coat as he made himself as comfortable as possible, tucking his legs into the fetal position. He reached back to the flap of skin he had used as an entrance point and folded it shut, bidding farewell to the whistling wind. The smell was even worse than he had expected, but the difference in temperature was instantly noticeable. How long he would have to remain inside the corpse he had no idea. He dreaded the thought of sleeping within it, cringing at the idea of rot and decay seeping its way into his body as he tossed and turned in slumber. A little bit of time passed, then had kept his ears sharply tuned to the sound of the storm, which was showing no signs of diminishing. The thought of a warm shower with Rachel helped him keep his composure, even as he repositioned himself for the fourth or fifth time. Without warning, a revolting churn erupted from behind his head, followed by a sharp rippling sound like tape peeling from a wall. Goosebumps trickled down his back as he turned to see what had caused the noise. The thin trickle of light coming from outside had ceased, Leonard reached out to reopen the flap, only to find it had sealed itself shut. He pulled at the inside wall relentlessly, assuring himself they had merely misplaced where he had made the incision. But no, there was no mark there. Plain as day, the scar from which he had separated the tissue remained perfectly reformed. Instantly, the fleshy walls of his meat prison seemed to be closing in on him, the heat growing infinitely more intense. He once again unsheathed his pocket knife, only for it to slide between his slippery gloves and disappear between one of the creature's organic crevices. Leonard screamed, writhing and squirming as his body sank into the carcass's watery fluids. A soaked tendril oozed out from the newly formed opening beside his neck, filling his mouth and reaching all the way into the depths of his throat. Several more tendrils wrapped around his arms and legs and rolled him over to face the opposite side of the creature, where a gaping maw stretched open and beckoned him inside with its lips. Even as he clawed his hands into the creature's flesh and strained himself against its push, Leonard found himself sliding closer into the maw with each passing second. Hot sweat poured from his brow like a waterfall, vomit rising in his throat only to be forced back down into his stomach. Pushed only inches away, he was thrust inside the opening the tendrils releasing their grip and the maw closing behind him, plunging him into pitch blackness. Ripping his gloves off, Leonard clawed incessantly at the flesh around him, only managing to scrape off tiny slices of meat with his fingernails. Small strings of a hard, wiry substance grabbed a hold of his head, pinning it to the side and burrowing into his skull. Blood spurting down his neck, Leonard felt his body go limp in an instant as the cord unsqueezed around his brain darkness intruding on the edges of his vision. The sound of static filled his ears before everything went silent. His senses switched off in a mere instant. Horrid, indescribable screams burst into Leonard's ears as he slammed back into consciousness. Leonard? He heard one of the voices shout, a little louder than the rest. Leonard, are you there? A piercing agony stuck its claws into his brain, as he felt it brush against the brains of many others, electrical impulses burning and carving their way through his mind like streaks of fire. His eyes were glued open, and before him lay the cold, desolate valley, snow still ravaging the ground, the storm just as intense as ever. A shattered, deformed hoof lay limp in the corner of his vision, and it took him a few seconds to realize the eyes he was staring through didn't belong to him. We try to warn you, Leonard. Another voice spoke. We try to warn you. He attempted moving his body, but knew deep down he didn't have one anymore. There was nothing but constant noise and the frozen, unmoving visage of the piling snow. Picking them out individually would be a near impossible task, yet Leonard was sure he could hear dozens of voices, some shouting, some whispering, some simply weeping all fighting to be heard over each other. Their collective attention was diverted by the appearance of a figure in the distance, wandering aimlessly through the storm. 
The noise grew to an unbearable level. Everyone screaming at the person to run, to get away, to seek shelter elsewhere, even as they got closer and closer towards the body. Leonard could only watch as Rachel spotted the carcass and ran toward it, a hopeful smile on her face. We'd been watching the skies for two days, but nothing irregular had occurred. I guess we weren't really serious about it either. Although we had spent several years digesting all the UFO stuff out there, magazines, YouTube, documentaries, you name it. It's just that. It's a fantasy, you know. A fantastic scenario you make up in your head to spice things up in this gruesome, disappointing world. I guess you could say, we wanted to believe. We wanted something more than this world was offering us. You know that feeling, don't you? Thing is, we got it bad. We got it. We'd taken my dad's car, a Toyota 4Runner capable of pretty rough off-road driving if you're a little bit careful. Our eyes were set on Lone Mountain in southeast Nevada and they gleamed with anticipation and good old fun as we took a left turn and deserted the asphalt road into the desert. The peak's not more than, say, 3,000 feet, but it's enough to get a clear view of the night skies. Actually, it's more than enough. As we got closer to the mountain, we left the desert roads and started off-road. We were joking around in the car, talking about what we'd do if we saw a UFO or well, what we'd do if extraterrestrials somehow contacted us. I guess we thought we were ready for it. And both of us said we'd actually love to be, as they say, abducted. In retrospect, that just seems bizarre. Naive little shits who just want to have their miserable lives, dreaming of something better, something bigger. We stopped the car and got out. It was already getting dark, but it was still warm and the last rays of sun painted the mountain in a promising and blinding yellow and red light. We prepped all our bags and started up the mountain with the sunset at our backs. None of us said a word going up. I don't know why, and I don't know if Ray felt the same way, but there was a seriousness to the peak and its surroundings that day. It demanded we show respect. We settled for a spot that was on a fairly squared plateau, perhaps 1,200 feet up and we would have gone higher if it hadn't been for the difficulties walking in the dark. We had flashlights, but it's not easy with all the shadows they cast, and a 60 pound bag on your back stuffed with canned spaghetti bolognese. We set the tent in the middle of the plateau and got a little fire going, like a little reward for the hard work. If you're planning to watch the skies, you really should skip all the coziness of the fire because it makes you blind to the nuances of the night. Now, as I said, two days went by without us noticing anything in particular. We didn't talk about it, but we were disappointed, and yet, not surprised. A fantasy is a fantasy, and it always hurts when it's confronted with a mundane reality. The only thing that had happened out of the ordinary was both of us feeling sick in the mornings. I had been laying awake for some time, skipping through some of the UFO magazines we had, when I saw Ray's eyes open in fear and running out of the tent, vomiting for several minutes. I had felt sick myself, but nothing quite as bad. The day before, we figured it was the bolognese. Disgusting fucking bolognese, what were we thinking? This morning, it seemed worse, though. Here's where the weird things started happening, and it gives me chills to tell you about it. When I got dressed on that third morning, whilst Ray was outside recovering from his intense puking, I felt, and I know how this sounds, a ripple in... space? Time. I don't know, but it was like someone changed a filter on how to perceive reality. I was confused because the feeling was really distinct, and I was about to call out to Ray when I heard him, talking to himself. He was mumbling something, and I could only make out some of it. Didn't want to. Didn't want to. Deeper. No, never. Up, upwards. Space. No, 
no, no, no, no, no, no, no. Infinity. Shut up! I could hear him retching, and I have to tell you, I started to get really worried. The words upward and infinity also stirred something in me, and I too felt dizzy and nauseous again. I stumbled out of the tent and grabbed a bottle of water. It was early. Ray was hunched over away from me, and when I came out, only his head turned towards me. His eyes were wide and gave me a terrified look for three to four seconds. He just stared at me with dread and something more. He radiated hate and contempt. He looked murderous. Now, Ray is not a heavy guy. He couldn't weigh more than 120 pounds, short and skinny with a melon-like head. And as his signature. That's how we know him. I'm a lot bigger than him, and stronger. I could easily take him if he attacked me, but two wide, hateful, beaming eyes is enough to make anyone twitch. I had to say something. Hey, man. How you doing? Everything all right? You don't look like yourself. Want me to fix you something? My words dispelled something in him, thank God. His body softened. His eyes started blinking and lost their wild expression. I don't know. I'm sorry. I think I had a nightmare or something. Maybe I have a fever. I seem to dream or hallucinate. But I think I might feel a little better now. I'll just sit here for a moment. By the way, are we going home? He sat down on a rock with his head in his hand, and I started to get some breakfast going. The morning was pretty cold, and I searched the area for dry branches that could be used to keep the fire going. Deeper. Upward. Infinity. Those words. I couldn't stop thinking about them. Had I dreamt too? When I got back, Ray seemed his normal self, and that day we just lay in the sun, talking about girls we liked, teachers we hated, schools we wanted to go to, and jobs we wanted to have. Yeah, we wanted a life. We didn't really want to be taken to another world. Fantasies are made to make us stand the gruesome waiting for life to begin. They're made to give luster to the boring rationality of pursuing a career and normal life. They're not made to come true. And they sure as hell shouldn't make you drive to the Nevada desert, begging the stars to come and get you. That night, darkness crept really close, and the stars glowed intensely. The fire was put out, and we were laying on our backs, staring up at the stars. I don't know if you've done this at a high altitude in the middle of the night, but it's an overwhelming experience. Two infinitesimal conscious beings each with a cute little name, two loving parents, and a bond of friendship, trying to grasp space with their eyes and hearts, longing for something, for feeling alive and fulfillment, and space staring back at you, its mystery promising to the empty heart. That's when I saw it, the most beautiful star ever, coming closer, Neither of us said anything as we held each other's hands, squeezing harder and harder. It just descended from space, from the stars, from our fantasies. It lit up the whole plateau with a blinding yellow and red light that seemed to make everything shine like it was golden. We started to laugh. It was true all this time. They're here and they've heard us, understood us and our boring lives. Tears ran down my face, and for a moment I felt happy, fulfilled. Then it just disappeared, out of nowhere. No direction, no nothing. A moment passed, and then I felt a surge in my stomach and shot up into the air like a cannon. It was like something just took me by the feet and hurled me up into the sky. The bodily feeling was extremely intense, and I instinctively curled up while simultaneously shrieking. The worst part was the spinning and wobbling, turning my stomach inside and out. I couldn't see much, but I thought I heard Ray screaming and begging for his life. I don't know if I passed out, but suddenly I saw myself from outside. A terrified little boy hurtling towards space, shooting holes in the clouds. Then the rippling again and perspectives changed. I was back in my body. 
We were now in the silence and infinity of space. We should have been dead, but we weren't. We were spinning through darkness, alone and abandoned. I could see Ray wobbling a few feet away with his legs squirming and stretching, like he was trying to feel the bottom of a lake. There was nothing. Only him and I, stumbling through the emptiness of freefall. No earth, no moon, no friendly aliens, no nothing. Distant stars in all directions forward unto infinity. I guess we both screamed, but not a sound could be heard. Only a word vibrating from my throat could be felt as the blood rushed to my head. There was no point. Ray started convulsing. He was a black silhouette, wobbling, twitching and turning, and every now and then his widespread eyes met mine. They were absolutely terrified. He was crying. I was crying. I missed my mom and dad. I missed our old dog Ben. Then Ray started melting. I don't know if that's the right word, but I've never seen anything that scary in my whole life. My friend was melting and disappearing. A moment later he was gone. I was alone, tumbling out of control in empty space, unable to make a sound. Go home. These words echoed in my head. They had begun a while back, but I noticed them the first when I was alone. I am an obsessive-compulsive kind of guy. I always get songs or quotes or phrases stuck in my head, unable to get them out, so this wasn't a total surprise. Go home. They had a whispering quality to them, and they sounded threatening or angry. Leave. I figured they had to be something else entirely. Something that hated me. Something that wanted me to never set foot back here again. I had disturbed something or someone. It was the strongest feeling. I had a sensation of someone standing behind my back, staring at me, beaming hate at me, reaching for me. I cried. I felt unwanted, deserted, and hated. A hated child in the vastness of space with no one to care for me. I thought about my mum missing me when I felt the ripple again. I was back on Earth. It was her. I was her heart. In a few seconds I relived a lifetime of sorrow and happiness, of breaking and healing, of hoping and despairing. Words echoing through time. I'm sorry, ma'am. There's nothing we could do. She died in her sleep. It was peaceful. Words tearing holes in my being. My little sister. Lost to SIDS before her time. How did mum survive? But life sparked again against all odds and inertia. Hope gathered strength and I was born. Love penetrating this broken heart, stitching it back together. Until almost anew. Mum's eyes broke through my little being, hoping, wishing, longing. She wanted the very best for me, like all mothers. The ripple again disturbed my vision. Now in another familiar chest. Dad's. Hatred and fear filling me up with sounds of shouting. A man with a bottle in his hands yelling and growling whilst banging at a locked door. It must have been my grandpa who died when my dad was nine. From the other side of it, a woman screaming. He spotted us, leering, grinning, walking towards us in our crib. And then new words. Dad's words. His promises. I will never treat my family like that. A new ripple, and then Ben's familiar smell. Longing, waiting for me to come home. Trusting me to come back and to be with him. To look at him, to need him. Every day, the sad goodbye and the hope of return. The breaking and healing, the leap of love and faith. Dog life. A final ripple, and then the blackness of space yet again. They loved me, and I loved them. Had I forgotten? It was never about me, it was about us. It was never about wanting more of life. It was about forgetting love and connectedness. It was about the battle between individualism and real love. But there was no love in space, only fantasies that cannot breathe, 
hatred and not belonging. I closed my eyes and prepared to die or drift forever in my tomb. Go home. I opened my eyes. We were laying on our backs next to each other, me and Ray. It was dark, but the stars shone with a pale, gleaming light. We held hands. He started crying. I want to go home, but I can't move, he said, tears streaming down his face. I put on my headlamp and picked him up on my back. I felt stronger than ever and felt how time and love and hope and sorrow flowed through my veins like fire. We stood for a moment, panting in the dark with my headlight as our only guide, when another light source made the night turn into day. The star had reappeared, and the plateau was now golden and simmering with feelings of hate and contempt. Go home. Leave. This time the words were like the words of God. They boomed with a force that could shatter bone and make the ground tremble. Coarse and stern was the voice and the message. I ran. Ray cried and clung to me like a baby clings to its mother. It gave me even more strength and determination. We heard indeterminable sounds following us. I could see unworldly beings staring at us from the shadows. It looked as if they were laughing. But I couldn't care less. We were leaving and never coming back, simple as that. I almost ran into the Toyota waiting for us. The sight of it and all that it reminded me of made me laugh hysterically. We drove away, nearly wrecking the car before returning to the roads of civilization. We could hear thunder roaring and shortly after it started raining. A few times the silhouette of the lone mountain towered in the distance as lightning struck the uninviting hills. We were going home, and we would love and be loved. There is nothing more to this world. Dead animals have been showing up near my house recently. By Icy Dice. Look, I'm not going to start a blog post dedicated to weird and awful experiences that have been happening to me, nor will I write a book about paranormal activities I've witnessed. In truth, my life has been pretty mundane up until this point. I mean, I won't lie to you guys. Sure, I'm superstitious and religious, but that belief is based purely on faith, not evidence. Well, a little context probably won't hurt, would it? I live at the end of a rather small neighborhood. The woods and a house awaiting purchase are all that exist behind my home. And ahead of it is a rather lifeless street of maybe a half dozen houses. I swear to you, the homeowners of said places are almost never there. But I suppose that's what a 9 to 5 job does to an adult, truthfully. I find the barren landscape calming and soothing for the most part. The strange feeling of comfort that comes with limited isolation, and that's as best as I can describe it, really. There was, however, one night in particular that shut things up a bit, for lack of better words. Now, for a night so important to me in the events of this story, I find it odd I can't seem to remember the exact date. For some reason, I found myself up until almost midnight. My parents were tired and, of course, told me not to stay up too late. Furthermore, I remember them asking me to take the dogs out before I went to bed. I was much obliged to do so in return for staying up late, so I promised I would. After some time watching a bit of Netflix, my eyes wandered down to the clock within the TV box. It had been almost an hour since my parents had gone to bed. I rubbed my eyes and felt a bit tired myself, so I grabbed my dog's leashes and took them outside to walk. I walked down the long gravel driveway and stepped into the street. I let my flashlight illuminate the road in front of me and continue down the path, allowing the dogs to finish their business. Once they were finished, I turned to go back to the house. But I stopped dead in my tracks once the light hit a certain area of the road. Just a few feet in front of me sat a lump on the ground I hadn't seen before. I had to restrain my dogs with quite a bit of strength as they seemed to notice it as well and attempt to reach it. 
and decided that I would bring them into the house and go back outside so I could see where the lump had been. As I approached it a second time, I bent down at the knees and let my light hit it. That was when a knot turned in my stomach. It was a frog. A baby frog at that, lying belly up. Several thoughts ran through my head. One, the frog was still there. What I mean is, upon viewing it, I suspected a predator had killed it. However, the frog was still on the road, dead. Not a single part of it was even eaten. However, the stomach was slid down the middle and the intestines sat beside the amphibian. The eyes seemed to have been removed as well. Maybe this wouldn't have seemed so odd if they weren't for the size of the creature. They were so small in size that such injuries seemed... intentional. I shuddered a bit, then decided upon going inside again. Having had enough of the mess before me, I made sure to lock the doors that night. Don't ask me why. I guess I just felt as if I had to. When I went outside the next morning to go to school, I went to the spot I had seen the dead frog. There was nothing there. Assuming that whatever had killed it cleaned up the remains, I walked to the bus stop. On the way there, I kept my eyes peeled for any other dead animals on the road. There were none. When I got home from school, I decided I would ask my mum about what I had seen. Perhaps she would have an explanation I hadn't previously considered. After listening to my story intently, she suggested that maybe a neighbor's cat had been the cause of it all. I nodded my head and accepted her answer. It would make sense, after all. I've heard of cats randomly killing small creatures all the time. That night, and the next few nights that followed, I saw the frogs on the road again, always in close proximity to my home. This still unnerved me, but I didn't pay much mind to it. I simply ignored the bodies and walked my dogs as normal. That was until one morning in particular. Another day of school had arrived, and I did my normal daily routine. I got up, showered, got dressed, ate breakfast, and brushed my teeth. I exited the house, ready to go to the bus stop. I walked down the driveway, as always, and then I stumbled back. Right in front of me was a squirrel, completely snapped in half. The two pieces of its body were perfectly symmetrical. It sat in a pool of its own blood, an expression of shock and horror etched onto its face. I gagged and quickly ran past the body. I pulled out my phone and texted my mum, explaining to her that there was a mutilated squirrel directly in front of our driveway. I quickened my pace and arrived at the bus, where I then got a response from her. She said she would check it out. After waiting a few minutes, she texted me again, asking me where I had seen it. I stared at the text in disbelief, unsure how she could possibly miss such a sight. I described exactly where it was, and then waited a few more minutes. Again she responded, and my eyes widened at what she said. Where I had seen the animal, morbidly attacked and bloodied, she saw nothing. Chills ran down my spine and I was generally shaken to my core. I tried asking a few of my school friends if they had experienced anything similar to what I had. None of them had any idea what I was talking about. Much to my surprise, the nights after that seemed to calm down. I didn't see any more frogs or other animals on the road, nor did I see any on my way to school. It almost seemed as if the strange anomaly had stopped on its own over time, and for that I was thankful. There was a strange period of time when nothing happened at all. Looking back, I was foolish to think it had ended there. No, I should have known it all along. It wasn't the end of the storm, but the calm before it. This peace I experienced came to an abrupt end just two weeks ago, on a night that seemed just like every other night. My father had been the one to take the dogs out this time, because I was busy walking towards the mailbox. I had neglected my duties to get the mail earlier in the day, so now I had to get it around 12 due to my procrastination. I grunted in annoyance at the fact that I wasn't allowed to go to bed until I did this chore, but I accepted it. I brought it upon myself, after all. I had started walking at a slow pace, but sped up as I went along. There were woods to both sides of me because of how the roads are positioned, and I was slightly creeped out by a feeling of being watched from within the branches of the enormous trees. 
The street lights had already shut off, and I was relying on my dim phone light to find my way since my dad was using the flashlight to walk the dogs back at home. My entire body felt tense as the adrenaline rushed throughout me, ready to burst into a sprint at any noise. I resisted this urge though, since the entire neighborhood seemed silent, strangely enough, although I believe that may have actually added to the eeriness of it all. I finally arrived at the mailbox, inserted my key into the lock and opened it. I reached my hand into the hole and felt around. I didn't feel a single letter inside, but my hand did land on something odd, something squishy and moist. My hand instinctively recoiled as I took a step back. I peered into the mailbox, shining the light inside so I could get a better glimpse of what I had felt. When I did see it, it took all of my strength not to scream. There, inside the mailbox, to which only I had the key to open, was a frock. Needless to say, I sprinted as fast as my legs would carry me until I reached my home. I launched myself up the porch stairs and entered the room. Closing and locking the door behind me, my breath exasperated. My parents looked at me strangely, and I quickly explained myself by claiming I was worn out from my run home. They didn't seem to question this, whether it was from believing me or being too tired to wonder why the hell I was running for so far so late at night. Regardless, they went to bed and I locked the doors. I didn't remember falling asleep, but I remember waking up in a pool of sweat. I sat up, looking around me, seeing the entire room entrenched in total darkness. From within my room, I could hear something strange. It sounded like footsteps. Footsteps ascending the wooden stairs leading up to the front door. And then I heard a signature creak of the door open slowly. And that was when I felt my heart rise to my throat. Despite my mind screaming to my body that I should hide or stay put, my body disobeyed and opened my bedroom door. My ears were filled with the sound of my dogs barking furiously, but the barking soon turned into something else. Whimpers of fear, and then screaming. Screaming which pierced my ears and made my heart come to a standstill. Screaming which didn't sound like dogs at all, but rather a human being instead. Despite my better judgement, I found myself running into the living room where I found my two dogs, battered and bruised with cuts and scrapes all around them. They sat in place, seemingly unable to move. I could see their mouths open and their throats emitted the same human scream of utter agony and despair that they had earlier. My feet trudged across the carpet, methodically making my way towards them. They screamed louder and more violently the closer I approached until I heard a crack. Their bottom jaws unhinged, revealing a gigantic maw. They stood on their two feet as a man would and their once human groans of pain turned into an inhuman, ungodly shriek which split my ears, causing me to clutch my head in pain. Then, just as suddenly as they started, they stopped and collapsed to the ground. Dead. I felt myself rush towards them, but I never got close. I felt something from behind me clutch me in its appendages, and I felt my body being pulled back into something sharp, stabbing me and causing me to roar in pain. I swear to you, my voice was not my own. No, it sounded like that inhuman screech my dogs released. I saw my vision become blurry until it all faded to darkness. And that was when I sat up in my bed. I rubbed my face with my hands, feeling the sweat pooling under my eyebrow. I raced out into the living room only to see my dogs laying comfortably in their beds. I didn't sleep a wink for the next few nights after that, nor did I mention the dream to anyone until now. The night that followed, well, several nights in fact. The woods located behind my house would cause my dogs to go into a frenzy when nearby. I remember walking them and, when close to the tree line, they would stop dead in their tracks, stare into the darkness ahead and took their tails between their legs, whimpering. Even I became uneasy around the woods now, despite not having logical reasons to be. 
but something about that place seemed more ominous than it did before these events started taking place. Nonetheless, I can't walk near that place without getting the chills, and neither can my pets, it seems. Again, the calm before the storm arrived, and each day and night without a single strange occurrence was truly nail-biting. That nightmare was all I could think about, and my lack of sleep showed at school. After several detentions for falling asleep in class, my grades dropped drastically, and my parents became worried. I never told them what had happened, though. They wouldn't ever believe me, especially since I seemed to be the only person who had witnessed these events. I only bring this up to you guys because I'm becoming increasingly worried. You see, these strange occurrences have picked up recently. Just as recently as a week ago, in fact. Nothing too extreme has happened yet, but I'm worried that might all change soon. The dead animals I've been seeing aren't just frogs anymore. There are birds now, and even a few small squirrels. Each and every night I see them. And each and every night they come closer and closer to my house. I'm not sure if what I experienced was just some sicko out there messing with me, or if something is going on in my neighborhood. All I know is that I have nothing to prove this is all happening, as each animal I see disappears without explanation by morning. I know for a fact that this isn't just some cat. Look, the point is that last night I heard something familiar. Something terrifying. I woke up to the sound of creaking. The creaking of wooden stairs leading up to my house, to be specific. I heard footsteps, which stopped just outside of the front door. I didn't have the courage to open the door and lock, so I peered through my bedroom window to see what was outside. Once my eyes became adjusted to the darkness, I was able to spot a lump on the welcome mat just outside my door. I couldn't discern the exact features of what it was, but I already knew in truth, and I couldn't sleep any longer that night. Once morning arrived, I looked outside the door only to see nothing, as I expected. It wasn't until that I realized I had never heard anything descending the stairs that night, which caused a large knot in my stomach. I don't know what's going to happen tonight, but I feel like it won't be good. There's no way anyone will believe me, and I don't know what can or will help me at this point. I loaded my rifle and made sure my hatchet and knife were within grabbing distance tonight. I'll also be sure to lock the doors. I'm not sure anymore. I'm just taking all the precautions I can at this point. All I can think of is that damn nightmare. Small update. I made a last second decision to let my dog sleep in my room last night making sure to lock the door behind me. Call me paranoid, but there's no such thing as being too safe at this point. I didn't sleep at all last night, and I didn't hear anything at all either. Finally, at about 4am, I let sleep overcome me. When I got up this morning to prepare for school, I found a dead, mutilated frog right outside my bedroom door. Sunken by Jadishin Matt stood on the deck of his boat, gazing out over the gentle waves. This was the spot all right. He would never forget the place he'd scattered the remains of the woman he loved. Just like she'd asked for. The place seemed somehow holier because of it. A feeling which persisted even though a year had gone by. Thoughtfully, he fingered the small vial that hung like a pendant on a chain around his neck. Of course, he couldn't let all of her go. He had to keep some small part of her with him, no matter how small. Every now and then, he imagined the small spoonful of ashes had come from his beloved lips. He would kiss the vial gently before turning in for the night. That was the kind of kiss he gave the vial now. I'll always miss you, Dana. He said out loud, 
At last, it seemed his visit was coming to an end. He was about to make his way back to the steering wheel when a large thump to the side of the boat nearly knocked him off his feet. The hell? He thought. He simply stood there for a moment, waiting to see if it would happen again. Then there came another thump, this time from the other side. It was louder and stronger than the first. Matt's mind immediately went to Wales. He shuddered. The idea of such massive creatures trying to knock him out of the boat and into the water. It was almost more than his sanity could bear. He managed to steady his breathing as he peered over the side of the boat. The water was clear. There were no signs of any animals in the water. And what was more, everything was quiet now. Still. The threat seemed to have passed. Slowly, Matt straightened himself up. No sooner was he on his feet than a third thump, the largest and loudest of all, sent the boat rocking. Matt was unprepared. He toppled off his feet, smashed his side into the gunwale as he fell, and there was only water. Matt flailed frantically, eyes clamped shut, completely clueless as to which way was up. It was then something gripped his ankle. Matt begged for it to be seaweed he could simply kick off, but it felt distinctly like a hand with four fingers and an opposable thumb. His heart sank further when whatever had gripped him seemed to be pulling him downwards. Matt's eyes opened. His fears were confirmed. Above him he saw the light and silhouette of his boat, the symbols of salvation. But whatever had his ankle would not let him go, no matter how hard he kicked. Suddenly, another hand grabbed his other leg, just below the knee. Then the hand on his ankle released, only to come back down on his outer thigh. The two hands climbed higher and higher up Matt's body. He knew that soon, he would come face to face with whatever was going to kill him. And it was going to kill him. He had no way of escaping. Once again he shut his eyes. One hand was now on his waist, and the other finally clamped down onto his shoulder. A few seconds passed which, to Matt, felt more like an eternity. With his eyes still closed, he flinched as he felt something hard and bumpy brush across his mouth. Softly at first, but then harder. This patch of hard lumps seemed surrounded by something softer and pulp-like. Bits of it came off on his face. The fuck? Matt's panic began afresh. What the fuck is it doing to me? As soon as his face was set free, his eyes shot open. He was not prepared for what he saw. Before him was a face, if it could be called that. It seemed to be made entirely of grey dirt or ash. Its sunken eyes stared out at him, right above two holes that served as a nose. Worst of all, however, was its mouth. Where the rest of it was covered in some kind of ashy skin, the teeth and bones of its mouth were completely bare, giving the creature a gruesome, permanent grin. The creature moved suddenly. Matt felt it grasp the vial around his neck. The chain broke free in one swift motion. Then, the creature seemed to release him. It removed its hands from him and sank back down into the darkness of the water below. Matt wasted no time. He kicked and flapped like his life depended on it. At last, he broke the surface of the water and gasped in air until his lungs felt like they would burst. He used his adrenaline rush to launch himself over the boat's gunwale. At last... He was safe. For a while, he simply lay there, trying to process what happened. Who would believe him when he made it back to land? No one. And yet, how was he going to keep this to himself? It was simply too extraordinary. Out of habit, he reached for the vial that hung around his neck, only to remember too late that it was no longer there. A stinging tear began to form in the corner of his eye. His moment of mourning was cut short when another loud thump landed on the underside of the boat. No, Matt begged silently. No, oh God, please. He crawled to the gunwale and looked over. The sight made him shudder. Swimming alongside the boat was a humanoid figure. A head, two arms, two legs. It was the same creature that had grappled him. It had to be. 
The thought that there could be more than one was enough to send Matt straight over the edge. The creature then turned its head to Matt. A mix of horror and relief swam within him. Much of it was the same as before. Sunken eyes, slits for nostrils. But something was different. Now its face was complete. No more ghastly, grinning bone. Instead, it had a pair of jagged, black lips. Fugetti Me Not by Doom Room The sun began to set, causing the sky to turn a radiant orange. To observe something so beautiful from the snow-covered Himalayas should have been illegal. It was absolutely breathtaking. Come on, Ned! We haven't got long before dark! Ned Tubber turned and followed the voice to its source. His dapper and dark-skinned best friend, Orwell Thatcher. Right you are, Orwell! Ned shouted in reply as he slowly advanced towards the newly erected shelter. The snowfall and wind both increased in speed and intensity, causing Ned's visibility of the shelter to diminish. Ned raised his gloved hands to shield his face and goggles as the wind battered him with snow. Had he not been wearing multiple layers of clothing, the strong wind would have blown him over. Orwell Thatcher peered out of the tent to see what was up with his friend's delay. He quickly ducked his head back in after becoming aware of the blizzard. Hey Gil, there's a blizzard, exclaimed Orwell in frustration as he turned to the burly, red-haired man with enough metal in his face to rival a box of nails. Ah, oh, shit. Ned's still out there. What do we do, man? Get some goggles and grab my hand. Combined weight should prevent us from being blown away. Not to mention it'll keep us from getting separated. Ned Tubber flailed wildly as he waded through the snow. As if to retaliate, the wind picked up speed, blew Ned off of his feet and onto his coat-covered stomach. Try as he might, the wind refused to allow him to stand. Eventually, Ned stopped struggling and gave himself to the cold snow. Something isn't right, Gil, Orwell stated honestly. How you mean? Ned wasn't that far from the tent. I should have found him by now. Lord forgive me for even suggesting. What if he wandered the other direction? Orwell's hazel eyes widened at the thought. The two men carried on for a time until Gil suggested what Orwell was thinking, but refused to suggest. It was time to head back to the shelter or they'd both freeze to death. Orwell relented after a minor debate. As the men walked towards the camp, Gil tripped and let out a loud curse as his hands let go of Orwell's and he fell. Are you alright? I am better than alright, man. Look what I found! Orwell peered down and saw that Gil had tripped over an unconscious Ned. After helping Gil back up, Orwell lifted up Ned and swung his arms around his and Gil's shoulders. The two men carried their unconscious climbing buddy back to their tent. Ned awoke to find his finely groomed friend, Orwell, sitting next to him. Ned replayed the last few events in his mind before speaking. Thanks, Orwell, he managed weakly. Don't worry about it, buddy. That wind was so strong and unreal. It blew me off my feet and I just couldn't manage to get back up. It wasn't the wind. Pardon? It wasn't the wind. Something clawed your feet back and knocked you down. We noticed a claw mark on your coat after we got you back here. Luckily, it didn't penetrate beyond that. Whatever it was managed to knock the wind out of you. I suppose it could have been a Himalayan black bear. Impossible. Those are only able to live around 14,000 feet. We're at Camp 2, which, need I remind you, is at 21,000 plus feet. Well, whatever. The danger has passed. Is it day yet? Yeah, you ready to start climbing? Sure am. Everest isn't going to climb itself. Ned stated as he stood up and started towards the exit. Hold it. We should pass the 26,000 mark today, so we'll need oxygen. Right. Right. After the two men finished equipping their oxygen tanks and masks, they headed outside. The two men were shocked by what they saw upon exiting the tent. A few feet in front of them stood Gilbert Sarks, with smoke rising above his head due to the blunt in his hands. Gilbert gasped and tried to hide the blunt behind his back, but it was too late. Orwell snatched the blunt from the redhead's hands and tossed it off the side of the mountain. Not cool, man, Gilbert mustered. 
I told you to leave that shit at home, and you should have known better, seeing as how drugs destroyed Orwell's family, Ned replied with disinterest. But it was for my glaucoma. That's all the excuse. Come up with something better. Actually, just don't smoke that nonsense, especially around me, Orwell said in a strained voice. Go get your oxygen so we can pack up and get climbing. The three men dug into the snow-covered mountain with their ice axes and continued their quest to reach Everest's summit. They were not rookies by any means, therefore they moved with grand precision, always carefully placing their feet into the fresh-cut footholds. However, even experts are capable of making mistakes and being caught off guard. The wind picked up and produced a blizzard doing just that. I say, what the hell is up with this weather? Ned shouted to Orwell and Gilbert. At this rate, we aren't going to make it back home, let alone to the top. Gilbert, who was taking up the rear, looked to his left and noticed a cave that was embedded into the side of the mountain. Hey man, there's something over there. Looks like a cave. We could wait out the weather in there. The three mountaineers climbed over and made their way into the cave, one by one. If we head deeper in, we might be able to find an exit closer to the top. We'll get out of the wind if nothing else, Orwell stated. Sure, beats just sitting here and waiting out the hormonal weather, Ned replied with enthusiasm. The cavern darkened the further they went, at least briefly, until they reached the point where small holes in the mountainside were present, and small rays of light shone through. Ned ran his hand through a few of the holes. This feels strange, like it was cut or carved. It feels chipped, Ned stated in disbelief. Uh, you're right. There's no way that's natural, Orwell replied in an astonished tone. A shuffling sound echoed from farther down the cave. It gradually became louder and louder. It was getting closer. Let's head back the other way. There shouldn't be any life this high up, and I'd rather not deal with whatever I'm hearing, Ned whispered to his two friends. Before another word could be said, or any action could be taken, a large white figure lumbered into view. The four beings stood still, eyeing each other intently. The white of the figure was snow. Its fur was naturally black, and was that of a Himalayan black bear. However, upon closer inspection, Ned came to realize that the fur wasn't the creature's own. It was no bear. The others seemed to realize this truth as well. Gilbert Sarks dropped to his knees and produced a cross from one of his coat pockets. Gilbert raised the cross up to his eye level and began to chant. The power of Christ compels you. Oh God, help me, man. The creature's purple eyes peeked out from underneath the fur coat and regarded the speaking human very briefly before it raised a fur covered appendage and shot forth a black tentacle-like appendage with three sharp prongs. The prongs struck the praying man in the stomach and acted as a fishing line which reeled the screaming wounded man back to the beast. Ned and Orwell momentarily stared in disbelief before making a run for it. Ned felt a mix of sadness and relief when Gilbert's screaming ceased. The relief was momentary, however, as if the two men's imagination regarding the fate of their friend wasn't enough. A loud popping sound could be heard, followed by something that sounded like marbles hitting the floor. Although they had a considerable lead, a shower of crimson managed to coat some of the cave wall in front of them. As Ned ran, he noticed a rolling sound which was getting closer. As the sound passed him, Ned saw it wasn't marbles rolling across the floor, but some of the metal that had been in Gilbert's face. Another horrible realization hit the man as he neared the exit. The blood wasn't splashing the wall in front of him. The creature's tendril had been trying to stab him and was missing causing it to smear his friend's blood across the wall. Shit! echoed Orwell's voice as the cave exit came into view. Ned knew full well why Orwell had made the expletive when he had also been able to see the exit. The blizzard was going at full force. Ready the rod, we'll abseil down! Ned barked at his friend, whom had a lead on him. This is nuts! Orwell complained as he forced the metal rod into the mountain ground and secured the rope to it. It's do or die, Orwell! Despite the head start, the creature had pretty much caught up to its potential prey, as they had reached the cave exit. It shot a barbed tendril at Ned Tubber, but overshot again. Ned greeted the tentacle with his ice axe. The beast let out a mighty roar as it shot out another tendril in response. Although the prongs missed, 
The appendage struck Ned and sent him off the side of the mountain. Orwell heard screaming and cursing as he descended the rope. He saw Ned falling right past him. Ned reached out as he fell and by sheer skill, or perhaps luck, caught the rappel rope with his right hand. Orwell grinned at the sight, but his grin quickly became replaced with a frown when he looked back up and saw the snow creature had lifted the metal rod, which secured the rope out of the ground. After letting out a blood-curdling roar, the thing threw the rod and rope off the side of Mount Everest. Orwell tried to use his ice axe to dig into the mountain and hang on, but wasn't quick enough. Whilst Ned was still firmly placed in the beast's appendage, both men fell. Ned uprighted himself off the snow. He had been fortunate enough to not have such a falling distance. Orwell was not so lucky. Orwell had broken nearly every significant bone in his body and died on impact with the ground. Ned staggered to base camp too, despite the weather conditions. A separate group of mountaineers spotted Ned and helped him down the mountain. Ned Tubber went home to his wife, Sam, and young son, Elliot. He'd spread tales of a snow monster which he believed was a yeti. Only his wife believed his claims. Ned would often relive the event in his nightmares and carry the worst sort of guilt for the rest of his life. Survivor's Guilt The White Desert by Kamrichi 1969 The following text is taken from a letter found washed up on the southwest coast of Africa in a sealed container. Its contents have been translated into modern English, and the site at which it was composed along with the identity of the writer remains to be unknown. For the sake of time, I am choosing to withhold any details I deem not to be important. What matters right now is that this message reaches safe hands, and I am able to supply whoever may read this with enough information on my current situation. As I write this message on paper intended to create a journal, I am sheltered within the wreckage of the Corvette, and I am lucky to be blessed with the time to write this. I may not have a lot of time, but it should be enough. Dear reader, you must understand that this is not meant to entertain, but to instead warn of the dangers of prying into the unknown. This information you are about to receive is not fiction. I cannot, and I will not stress this enough. There is no other place to start than the beginning. I am part of a secret expedition with the aim to successfully circumnavigate the globe, traveling a route which has not been taken before. My place on the ship was as a surgeon, tending to the sick, curing the diseased and hacking off frail limbs riddled with infection. I had to deal with a lot of illness, as any surgeon would on a journey like this, but I was almost always busy despite my small crew size. On board were around 60 or so people. The normal sized crew for this vessel would have been much larger, but we were not expecting any trouble during our voyage. We traveled south what felt like decades. I'm not certain for how long as I was not the one to keep track. Nevertheless, I'm sure at one point I heard a fellow crew member mention around about a year. Although this cannot be trusted as most men I treated were delirious with pain. After traversing the seemingly endless ocean wasteland, we came upon a new breed of wasteland. What we would later go on to name the White Desert. The crew, along with myself, were astonished at the spectacle before us. We had never seen such a grand display of frost in all our lives. What lay beyond the bow of the ship was a colorless canvas of snow, extending out in almost every direction as far as the eye could see. Sunbeams kissed the frozen land, illuminating every imperfection in the landscape and bringing to attention the disturbing lack of life in the expanse. Not a single soul resided in the godforsaken place. Our sense of wonder soon faded and the realization quickly began to spread among the crew. We had come all this way to discover nothing, nothing but the rotten cold. Like a metal vice, the icy grip of the frost suffocated all those who resided on the ship. The temperature had been decreasing for a while. However, we all sailed closer to the white desert. It reached increasingly unbearable levels that not even the soft fur of pelt clothing could combat. The sound of wood crunching and tearing began to increase in volume as well, as large gatherings of ice began to rip through the hull. Panic swept around the crew as quickly as the cold 
and everyone began to yell with the quartermaster's screams for order possessing the highest volume. Noticeable amounts of damage started to become apparent, mostly thanks to what looked to be an infinite amount of splinters launching themselves into the air and over the sides of the vessel. It was obvious she was going to wreck. Gut instinct took over, and I ignored the chaos on deck and ran for the shelter in the hold, grabbing onto any fixed objects that my desperate hands could find. A stampede of flesh rushed behind me in my pursuit, clawing and clambering through the debris in which had scattered onto the floors. As I grabbed the post of the bed, my body curled itself up and braced for the inevitable impact. I woke up moments after the wreck, buried under a considerable amount of wooden debris. Despite a few cuts and bruises, I was relatively unscathed, as I had been lucky enough to be cowering on the half of the ship which had reached dry land. Navigating through the crumpled ship proved difficult, but I soon stepped onto land to learn that not everyone was as fortunate as I. Roughly forty men had been violently flung into the ocean, as well as a few who had sunk down with the missing half of the ship. The remaining twenty lay on the island, moaning with pain, tending to the injured, or simply dead. I walked with caution over to the edge of the island and began to aid the rescue effort, dragging those who had washed up on shore to safety, alive or dead. As the last of the survivors had been dragged ashore, I began to treat those who had come from the sea, knowing they would most likely suffer from hypothermia. Stripping off the first victim, I accidentally discovered the White Desert's first signs of life. A previously unseen species of what I thought to be a leech. I watched as one of the white parasites suckled my patient's flesh before I decided to remove it. To my horror, the man was covered in them, and it took me a significant amount of time to remove them all. At this point, I wrapped him in soft fabrics to help him conserve body heat, before leaving him to treat the others. Every man I tended to was covered from head to toe in these leeches, leading me to believe that the waters surrounding the land were very densely populated with these creatures. In other words, we weren't leaving back the way we came on a makeshift raft. Once I decided that the people I had treated were in reasonably safe hands, I retreated to observe how those who had reached land during the crash were holding up. I can say that only around four different people had been as lucky as me. Those who arrived to the island on my half of the ship had either fallen a great height from the deck, breaking many bones in the process, or they had been buried under an avalanche of wood, suffering large splinters. Out of the sixty men crew, Five were unscathed, fifteen were injured, and the rest were missing, or dead. A particularly gory sight I came across was of a young man who had landed on the shore. He was impaled on a snap plank of wood which penetrated straight through his gut, protruding out of his back coated in a dripping red substance. The moisture in his eyes were completely frozen, and it was evident that the impact had caused a quick yet painful death. I've seen my fair share of guts and gore in my profession, but I couldn't help but look away from the sight. With the wounded in reasonably stable condition, our next priority was to survive. At this particular corner of Earth, night came fast, meaning that we would have to hurry to build shelter, find food, and prevent our body's core temperature from dropping any further. This was all easier said than done, Luckily for me, I did not have to face the pressure of being in charge of survival. A young man who I had treated for minor injuries was kind enough to take this responsibility. I was given a group of two men who were injured but still able to help, and told to look after the sick and injured whilst three of the other unscathed men were sent out to search for any means of rescue. And during this period of time, a small group of people began to build a fire with some shelter. The low temperatures in the following hours would send anyone begging for the fiery torment of hell. Only two people died every hour to my surprise, and every hour that passed had me praying for shelter to be built. I almost threw myself on the fire once it was kindled, and I tried my very best to absorb as much heat as possible. Just like I had anticipated, night came quickly, and before I knew it, all survivors were gathered around the fire. All eight of us. This was including the search party who I mentioned earlier, and whilst we were gathered around the fire, they informed us of their findings. They said they had walked for miles and found absolutely no life at all, resulting in the conclusion that all we had to eat was the rations from the wreckage. 
However, all hope was not lost. They also mentioned some peculiar deformities in the landscape. Large holes in the ice above a stream of water where many fish seemed to pass. From this, it was decided that it would be possible for us to create holes in the ice to catch fish using our bare hands. But these holes also suggested another more disturbing secret the island was holding. It was clear that carnivorous life resided in the island. Life with a taste for fish. And possibly human flesh. Needless to say, we all had to take guard shifts during the night in order to watch out for our potential predators. My hour was particularly painful, but I was relieved with the sleep I managed to steal afterwards. Our group was reduced to a measly five in the morning. Three of the injured had died in the night from infection or hypothermia, leaving every passing minute to become ever more hopeless. There was nothing I could do for them, given the circumstances, but that did not stop me from feeling pity. We decided to bury them in the ice, telling ourselves that this was a respectful gesture. This was a gruesome lie, however, as we were trying to preserve the body so that if it came down to it, we could shamefully eat them knowing we were not to starve to death just yet. Thankfully, we never got the chance to reach that point. The group's nominated leader once again sent the same three men out to explore, leaving the two of us alone in each other's company to manage food supplies and sources of heat. He was a quite pleasant fellow, and we found ourselves conversing frequently. A notable topic of conversation was the day of the shipwreck. He had told me that he had helped rescue those who had fell into the ice-cold ocean, turning to them in the same way that I had. It was at this point we spoke about the leeches. We both agreed that there was a strange amount of leeches residing in the water, and he even admitted that he had fell victim to a few bites as well. He went on to say that leech bites were oddly more painful than the common leech bite, but we believed that the cold had been a factor involved in this. Hours passed, and the temperatures became less devastating throughout the midday. I was starting to become concerned for my new friend, however, as his minor wounds from the wreck were in the late stages of infection, and I was becoming more and more helpless as the cold took hold of him. There was no doubt that he was not going to make it through the next night. Further adding to my worries was the fact that the exploration group had not returned. They had been out much longer than they were last time, suggesting that they had stumbled upon something of interest. Whether this was good or bad, I would never know until they returned. I tended to the temporary group leader as much as I could, but I subconsciously knew that it was hopeless. As he closed his eyes to rest, I had a strong suspicion that he would never open his eyes again. So I decided to leave him to dig up the pit we had just buried the other bodies in. When I had reached the pit, I was horrified to learn that it had already been dug up. Intrigued, I peered into the pit, only to find something which made me feel sick to my core. It was completely empty. In confusion, I darted my head around to observe my surroundings, to look for anything which would answer the headache-inducing question which rushed through my mind. I tried my very best to compose myself, and upon finding nothing in the foreground, I decided to analyze my surroundings more carefully. It was at that moment I noticed the footprints. Hundreds of them, all leaving the pit, spewing out in all directions I had previously consumed. I left my mark in the pale landscape in the form of a thick yellow stain. The cold, which seemed to have a tight grip on my body, almost entirely retreated as if my body had decided that it had larger issues to deal with. I traced the footprints with my eyes, and they all led me to a patch of land off in the distance. Refusing to go near that patch of land, I looked closely, and I soon noticed some mild imperfections in the snow. It took me a second to realize, but soon enough, I figured out where the missing bodies had went. I did not stay to launch the rest of my guts out of my throat, and I instead spun around and sprinted back to the camp to seek any help I could find. Running back to the camp, I realized just how much of the snow seemed to slow my movement. As I dragged my feet through this thick, frosty landscape, I looked ahead to see if any of the explorers had returned to the camp. Of course, they had not, and I was all alone. My last resort was to consult the man I had previously been taking orders from, but I feared he would be already damned. I was surprised to find that he was gone too, 
leaving nothing but a trail of footprints to a hole in the hull of the wrecked ship. He must have got up to seek further shelter, I thought, and so I made my decision to follow his steps. Inside the hull of the ship was pitch black, but I managed to locate the light source far within the hull. I stepped closer hesitantly, and I began to make out the silhouette of a figure in the distance. It was the man I was looking for. Calling out to him, I slowly trudged through the snow which had seeped into the ship during the wreckage. He did not respond, and as I looked closer, I noticed he was holding his face in one of his hands and dragged it with a slow pace. After I called out to him a second time, I finally received a response. He steadily pivoted around to face me, and this is when I saw that he was not holding his face in his hand, but was instead dragging sharp objects across it. The steps he took echoed a crunch of snow throughout the ship's hull as he made his way towards me. He dropped the objects in his hands and stepped in my direction with an ominous pace, placing his hands by his sides. I looked closely at the shadow, and then I saw its fingers were starting to grow longer and longer. They wriggled and writhed in sudden movements as if they were completely separate organisms. Backing away slowly was the only reply I gave, as I wanted to see what was pursuing me before taking flight in the opposite direction. It stepped into the light of the lamp that guided me down into this location, and I saw exactly what it was. It was exactly who I thought it was, but whoever I believed to be seeing was clearly not in control of the figure. His skin was a sickly shade of white, reflecting the color of the surrounding snow. The clothing on his body were exactly the same when I had left to dig up the pit, except they were ripped and torn, dangling in threads below his knees. Perhaps most disturbing was the condition in his eyes. They contained black pupils as small as needle pricks, and these pupils were surrounded by a milky yellow liquid that seemed to fill every corner of his eyes. They darted back and forwards between me and the exit, and my adrenaline in my body started to scream that I was in danger. The eyes of the being drew attention to its face, which possessed the exact same features as before, except for one very noticeable detail. A conclusion entered my mind as I managed to figure out what the creature had been doing with the sharp object. From one of the corners, all the way around to the other corner of the monster's lips, was a deep cut, which looked as though to circumnavigate its head. Orange blood oozed out from the wound and gushed down its face, yet it didn't seem to flinch or wince in pain. The creature realized that I intended to run for the exit, and it began to slowly raise two of its arms. On the ends of each of these fingers were maggot-like creatures, contorting and wriggling in search of something to satisfy their needled teeth. I looked with further perception and learned that I was gravely mistaken. They were not maggots. They were leeches. I spun around and bolted towards the light of the outside, but I did not move as fast as I hoped to, courtesy of the snow. To my dismay, it caught up with me and wrestled me to the ground in mere seconds. My immediate reaction was to shake myself free, but I was caught in a death grip I could not escape. Within seconds, I felt the leeches penetrate and tear through my skin, causing a jolt of pain which oozed into my body. I became desperate and searched for any weapon I could use to fight back. Of course, being in a ship wreckage, there were split planks of wood everywhere. Throwing my hands in every direction and ignoring the disturbing movements of the creature, I searched for the biggest plank of wood I could find, and was successful. With both hands, I smashed the plank over its head and watched it give no reaction at all. It distracted it enough, however, for me to kick myself free, and with haste, I clambered to my feet and composed myself. The wood I held in my hands was split because of the strike I gave to the monster, and as a result, it had gained a sharp tip. My aggressor followed me by raising itself to its feet and it continued its relentless attack and lunged at me. Without thinking, reflex caused me to extend my arm and point the makeshift spear towards the creature. In its determination to turn me into mulch, it skewered itself right through the gut and suddenly stopped moving. It stared me right in the eyes and slumped over, whilst I heard a shrieking coming from inside its body. The shriek was muffled, and the creature did not open its mouth, leading me to theorize that a separate organism resided within it. In a similar fashion, I slumped down to the ground, allowing me to catch my breath and tend to my wounds. The holes in my skin gifted to me by the leeches throbbed in pain and stung when touched. 
there were no ordinary leech bites. I fixed the wounds as best as I could and decided to leave the wretched place. I do not know what my immediate plan was, but instinct was insisting I ventured as far away from this horrible place as I could. As I left the breach in the hull I had entered from, I once again relieved the contents of my stomach all over the snow-covered ground. I coughed and spluttered, letting the now fading light of the outside world fill my eyes with its warmth as I looked upon the horizon. When I looked up, I recoiled back in a mixture of confusion and terror as something beckoned me in the foreground. The same corpses I saw when I discovered the empty pit had moved closer and were now directly in front of me. The thing I immediately noticed was the fact their skin resembled the tone of the creature I had just slain, and upon closer inspection I observed that every single one of them was positioned face down in the ground. However, their eyes were facing upwards. This detail contradicted everything I knew about human anatomy, and while I pondered this, I locked eyes with the creature who was closest to me. It was the young man I had previously seen straight after the wreckage impaled on the wooden beam. In the hole that the wood had penetrated straight through was what looked to be the body of a giant worm, pulsating and digesting living fish whilst wearing an armor that was made of human flesh. As it noticed me, a loud clicking noise emanated from what should have been the creature's face buried in the snow. In unison, all of the corpses steadily raised themselves up to their feet, showing me their bodies that had not seen a day of decay, whilst also allowing me to see the beings in their truest form. The upper part of each corpse's head was not fully attached to the lower jaw, and instead hung like a flap behind the monster's true head. It was almost as if the human head from the jaw upwards was like a hood. Emerging from their esophagus were what can only be described as a massive fleshy worms with dagger-like teeth lining their circular mouth, all the way down to their throats. Attached to the head of each giant worm was a network of nerves, all burying themselves inside their human host's skin and muscle tissue. Continuing to move as a unit, the nerves in each giant worm's head all began to violently twitch, and following its movements, their human heads all steadily rose and covered the worm's heads, forming gruesome helmets. They all stepped to the side, avoiding the holes at their feet which the worms had drilled into the ground, and began to move forwards towards me. Once again, I found myself running from the same pursuers, this time with the knowledge that I could not possibly outrun them. I sought refuge in the hull of the ship and glanced behind my shoulder, seeing a horde of around sixty men chasing me, all with their arms extended with leeches writhing from their fingers. They all burst through the hole in the hull, their combined weight causing the formation of an even bigger hole. All I could do was keep running. I stepped over the now shriveled and deflated corpse of the previous attacker and grabbed the lamp which illuminated him. When I reached the walls of the hull, I began to climb, refusing to look at the commotion behind me. Climbing must have been an alien concept to these parasites, as it took a while for them to follow my steps. I used this time to hoist myself up onto the highest level of the ship I could access, and I then began to search for somewhere else I could hide. I found a large barrel in one of the rooms, and emptied it of its contents before climbing in and sealing the lead. Before long, I could hear the echoed footsteps of sixty people rushing and searching for me, and over time, this faded to less and less, before an ominous silence filled my ears. This brings me to my current situation. I'm currently huddled in a barrel, trapped inside the shipwreck with nothing but a lamp illuminating my surroundings. As I write this very message, I am looking through a hole in the barrel at the source of the light penetrating the darkness, and I believe it to be the outside world. My plan is to pick the right window to leave my sanctuary, climb onto the deck of the ship and throw this message out to sea in hopes that this will reach civilization. The world must know of my fate. Occasionally I hear one of them pass and I cover the lamp in response so that they do not see the light source coming from the hole in my barrel. Maybe if I pick the right time I can fulfill my duty without confrontation. Maybe one will spot me, and the horde will rush me once again. Either way, I am afraid I will not survive. So dear reader, this is my final message. 
Nature is a powerful and relentless force. Sometimes it's best to leave the unexplored unexplored. I can hear it wriggling around in my head. Oh god, how it hurts. The Wood Line by Yaku Yabai I've only been living in Alaska for a year and a couple of months now. Well, with the constant weather change, it feels like I've been here a lot longer than that. It's barely September and it's already beginning to snow. That might be the norm for most people that live in the upper part of the U.S. But I'm from Texas. It doesn't really snow down there. Now, since I lived in Fairbanks, I keep hearing this story pass around about most of the bear attacks not being bear attacks at all. I find most of the stories childish and inconsistent. But there is this one that's caught my attention. A few months ago, there were many reported moose and bear attacks. A bunch of biologists were saying that it would be odd for there to be any bear attacks because July is the warmest month in Alaska, which means they have a constant supply of food. Moose attacks, according to the biologists, were very common among hikers because moose are very protective of their young and highly territorial. Around this time is when most of the stories from the native Alaskans began to circulate quickly. Alaska is one of the only places left in the United States that has tribes still functioning as they would have before any of the cities were established. The stories were quite shocking and unbelievable, but very popular. Not only in the Alaskan tribes, but in local middle school, high schools, and even among soldiers at the nearby military installation, Fort Wainwright. They warn people to stay wary of the wood line and to run west if you see an Inuk Arklark, which roughly translates into human bear. I've always thought their stories to be a bit far-fetched until a couple of days later. A 64-year-old man was mauled on his way to a family cabin near George Lake. George Lake is only 110 miles away from Fairbanks. The elderly man was found roughly 40 meters into the woods near a cabin off of the snowy trail with his limbs nearly torn from his corpse. His car was parked on the nearby trail in an unsettling manner. It was a little red car that was parked as if trying to block other vehicles from going any further. It's not known in any classified reports exactly when he parked the car that way. Was it before, during, or after the attack? No one can seem to come up with a good reason as to why he would even do that. It all comes back down to the stories the natives were telling everyone. The one about the human bear. My curiosity began to get the best of me, and I couldn't help but to ask questions. On a night out in downtown, at a bar and grill, I asked a group of native teens why they call it the human bear. But all they could give me were vague descriptions. Tall man, long arms that touched the ground, snout on face, small eyes. One of the native boys described it this way. I tried to use my imagination to puzzle the image together, but I was a little too drunk to be honest. It was getting dark, I needed to call a taxi, and the bar and grill was getting ready to close. I remember I was standing outside. There were a few building lights on, and the streets were empty, wet from the melted snow, and the chilly air made everything seem much more quiet. The reason I remember this night so well, even being moderately intoxicated, was because I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The taxi came, I got home safely, and I slept with the lights on that night. In the morning, I realized it was two days after the old man's death, and I found an article about him in the local newspaper. Name redacted, killed in bear mauling, the title read. It went on about how the family member that was at the cabin during that time of attack called the police, and when the police arrived, there weren't any signs of a bear. After a few hours of scouting, troopers known as the black bear roaming around and killed it. The biologist with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game told the authorities after examining the bear that she wasn't even sure if it was a black bear attack at all. The bite wounds and damage done to the victim's body aren't comparative to the bear's anatomy and capability, she said. I only ached to find out more after reading the article. 
I had to go to George Link. I made a few calls that Saturday and planned to leave as soon as possible. I wanted to make it back before work on Monday. I made sure to tell everybody at work where I was going and even told a few family members. I didn't want to get stranded out there and have no one know where to look when they noticed I'd been gone too long. I packed some snacks, clothes, a blanket, fueled up my truck, and drove southeast to George Lake. The further I drove, the more I began to realize that civilization doesn't exist this far away from where I live. The roads became narrower, made of gravel and dirt, but subtly covered with a frothy snow. Fir trees bordered the road so closely that I had to slow down for fear of hitting a moose running out of the woods. I had been driving for nearly two hours when I noticed it. I found the car. It was blocking the narrow road just as described in the reports. I stepped out of my truck and got a closer look at the old man's car and a way around it. I thought it would have been removed or something, but they left it here without any barricade tape. The sun was going down, I didn't bring a flashlight with me, and the air began to get cold. Colder. I figured I could wait in my truck until sunrise, and then walk to the cabin using the road. As I made my way back to the truck, I heard a small twig snap nearby. Normally, I would keep calm and collective, assuming it was a moose. But with this being the place the old man got killed, I couldn't help but run. I could hear twigs snapping and branches cracking faster and louder as I sprinted to my truck. I made it to the truck, opened the door, jumped inside, frantically making sure I locked all of the doors. I wanted to see what was out there. And I did. There it was, standing partially into the wood line, staring at me with a blank emotion. Beady black eyes, long dog-like snout, arms dangling as if they had no sockets. Mangy skin that was spotted grayish on a human skin tone, and ears similar to that of a bat. My eyes began to water and a cold shiver ran down my spine as I began to notice its frowning and unnatural twitching. It seemed to be twitching uncontrollably. I reached down for my phone to take a photo of it, but as I looked up, it was gone. I quickly snapped a photo of the car, started my truck, and shifted into reverse. It came running from the opposite side of the wood line its arms dragging up against the gravel, flailing and contorting. It let out a sound similar to a dog whining, but much deeper. I'm glad I drove away when I did, if not sooner. That's one image I won't forget. A few weeks later, I told the authorities about the incident, admitting the fact that I went there two days after the attack, and they took me to speak with the biologist that was assigned to the investigation of the old man's attack. I described to her the animal-like creature that stalked me. Out on, And she looked me in the eye and said, You've missed out on a lot of school, young man. While I felt she was insulting my intelligence, I asked her politely what she meant. She responded with, You most likely saw a brown bear. It was dark outside. And you could have imagined things on the bear that weren't really there. Most people get very shocked in this way, so it's understandable. Miss, I know I might not know as much about bears as you do, but I do know that bears don't run with just their hind legs, I said to her as I just stood up to leave. She looked up at me with the most worried expression I'd ever seen. Her eyes appeared to have watered up as she clicked her pen repeatedly. Before I left the room, I remember she whispered to herself, It can't be. In some native legends, animals appear before people in human form, and may even marry them and raise families. After reading this story, I decided to look some things up about bear people in Alaska, and I was met with this story about the woman who married a bear. A young woman went out to pick berries. On the way home, she stepped in a pile of a brown bear's droppings. She cursed the bear for always pooping in the pathway where a person could step in. The brown bear heard her insults. He appeared to her as a fine-looking young man. 
Come with me, he said. She followed him a long way up into the mountains. They came to a place with people. At least, that's how it seemed to her. When she awoke at dawn, she pushed aside the blanket and saw brown bears instead of humans asleep around her. She married the bear, who looked like a man to her, and they had two children. In the meantime, her five brothers searched for their sister. They found her footprints alongside bear tracks, and they knew she had gone with the bear. The brown bear had a vision. He told his wife, Your brothers are making medicine against me. The youngest will get me. The wife marked where they lived, so her brother could find the den. Your brother is getting close, the bear said. She begged him, please don't harm my brother. The brown bear knew that her brother would kill him, so he instructed his wife. Don't be careless with my skin. Drape it so my head points towards the setting sun. The wife took his instructions back to her people, and after her husband was slain, she did just that. And still today, hunters still follow this tradition and point the bear's head towards the setting sun. I just found this an interesting little addition to the story we just heard, and one thing I like to think of. What did happen to her and the bear's children? Did they rejoin the tribe as humans? Or did they live as bears? Or something in between? The End of the Path By Certain Shadows My family moved to a small, unassuming rural town called Cranesville shortly after I turned twelve. We rented a brick house nestled at the end of a winding dirt road lined with statuesque trees and surrounded by acres of forest, where I enjoyed an amount of roaming space that seemed almost extravagant compared to the cramped apartment we'd lived prior to our relocation. Among our scattered neighbours was a girl my age named Joanna. She, too, had recently moved into town, and despite my shyness and cursedly awkward nature, we soon became friends. Joe and I spent most of June's sunny days riding our bikes throughout town, taking in whatever film was currently playing at the single-screen theatre and poring over books at the Cranesville Library. While Joe shared my love of fiction, her interest lied predominantly in illustrations. Oftentimes during our outings, she would reach into the patched messenger bag she always carried with her, retrieve a sketchbook, and commence drawing the subject that had captured her eye. Joe was bright, highly creative, and kind enough to give the timid new kid in town a chance, rather than largely ignore me like the other local youths had. Joe wasn't simply my best friend. She was the only friend I ever had in Cranesville. But all these years later, I still dearly wish I'd never met her. The older I get, the more I've come to realize how unfair memory can be. It's funny in a bitter, cruel sort of way. Some of my happiest recollections from decades ago have begun to fade and blur like aged out-of-focus photographs, but the painful moments have yet to lose their vibrancy. My remorse remains as vivid as ever. One morning Joe called to tiredly inform me that she was feeling unwell and would be staying home at her mother's insistence. I attempted to pass the time by watching television and perusing a paperback novel, but both activities ultimately failed to distract me from what I really wanted to do. Go outside, breathe in fresh air, and let the sunlight warm my skin. When that desire eventually grew too persistent to ignore, I climbed onto my bike and began a solitary journey down the winding road. I soon regretted my choice. The miles of dirt felt unbearably long as I traversed them alone. I was on the verge of turning around to head back home when out of the corner of my eye, I caught sight of something unusual. I came to a stop and glanced towards the towering trees at my right, where I saw a narrow soil pathway trailing ominously into the forest's green depths. I stared at the path in astonishment, for that afternoon was the first time I'd ever laid eyes on it. Joe had never pointed it out during our previous travels, and I'd somehow managed to overlook it entirely. I still don't understand why I dismounted my bike and approached the newly discovered path. 
It wasn't curiosity that propelled me forward, but a strange, magnetic-like compulsion. My uneasiness increased with every step I took, yet I pressed on anyway. The unsettling sense of disquietude continued to grow as I walked along the soil trail, occasionally sidestepping fallen logs and roots protruding from the ground. An eerie stillness lingered in the forest atmosphere, punctured only by the sound of my footsteps. Eventually I reached the end of the path. I found myself standing before a house so decrepit it appeared to be held together by little more than pure luck. The home was encompassed by knee-high grass, overgrown shrubs full of thorns and spindly vines that reminded me of thin serpents. Nearly every window had been damaged. Some bore spidery cracks that crept along the glass, whilst others were little more than a collection of broken shards. Several shingles were missing from the sagging roof, and what appeared to have once been a coat of crisp white paint had faded into a chipped, dingy grey. Judging by the house's appalling state of neglect, it seemed as if no one had lived there in quite some time. As I stepped onto the rickety porch, an abrupt euphoria washed over me. A sudden burst of elation bloomed within my mind. Never before had I ever experienced such unbridled, overpowering joy. I felt as if something wondrous awaited me inside this house, and I was supremely eager to greet it. My hand was gripping the rust-coated doorknob when a faint noise pierced through the blissful fog in my mind. Immediately I froze, much too frightened to dare move, and held my breath. Then I heard it again, this time much more clearly. A slight creaking sound, like footsteps shuffling across aged floorboards, was coming from the other side of the door. My eyes widened when I felt the doorknob begin to slowly turn beneath my fingers. It was enough to pull me free from my rigid trance. I jumped from the porch and ran as fast as my legs could carry me. My chest pounded as I leapt over every obstacle along the path before reaching my bike and wildly pedaling home. I chose not to breathe a word of the unnerving incident when my parents arrived home from work a few hours later. I knew they wouldn't be pleased if they discovered that I had been snooping around on another person's property, and I didn't want to risk being grounded for what remained of the summer. Two days later, Jo had recovered from her brief illness. When I regaled her with the tale of my afternoon in the forest, she gawked at me with a combination of incredulity and excitement as storm clouds rumbled above us in the grey sky. You have to show me that path, she declared enthusiastically. If we leave now, we can make it home before it rains. I blinked in amazement, stunned by her proposal. There's no way I'm going back there, but I've gone down that road countless times and never seen any sort of pathway before. It might take me ages to find it on my own. Are you serious? Did you just miss the part about the creepy house? Jo smiled. Though her kind expression lacked condescension, I could tell that she didn't fully believe me. You probably heard a harmless noise. I mistook it for something sinister. That's not what happened, Jo. I felt the doorknob turn. But maybe you just thought you did. Remember when you spent the night at my house and you thought the tree branch outside my bedroom window was a ghostly arm? When we watched a horror movie and you had nightmares for almost a week? I shifted uncomfortably on my bike. Maybe. She smiled again. Immediately I felt rather foolish. Though I loathed to admit it, the undeniable truth was that at times my imagination had been guilty of outracing my common sense. We don't have to stay long. Joe reassured me. I just want to take a quick look and maybe do a quick sketch or two. Before I had a chance to respond, Joe had already begun to pedal away, determinedly. I followed and begrudgingly directed her towards the path, deeply regretting my decision to have ever told Joe about it at all. I could barely keep up with my best friend as we walked down the slender trail. The peculiar magnetism I'd experienced during my previous venture was replaced with a hideous, suffocating dread that made my feet feel as heavy as lead. I tried to convince myself that Joe was right, that I'd only imagined the creaking sound and the turning doorknob, but no amount of self-persuasion could quell my nervousness. By the time we reached the house, I was practically trembling with apprehension. Please hurry, I whispered. I don't feel good. I surveyed the area warily, whilst Joe scribbled into a sketchbook. 
Every minute crawled by at an agonizing pace. Despite the warm temperature, I shivered as light raindrops began to land on my skin. I looked up into the sky wistfully, wishing that I was sitting inside the library with a book in my hands or munching on popcorn at the theater. We've almost done. It looks like a storm's about to hit. I glanced back down and felt raw, unparalleled panic seize a hold of me when I saw the door to the house was now wide open, revealing an interior drenched in shadows. Joe? I tried to call out meekly, but all my mouth could form was a dull whimper. Every instinct in my body roared at me to flee, yet a mobilizing terror rooted me to the spot even as I heard the familiar creaking noise begin to emanate from the home's dark confines. I watched in paralyzing horror, my heart hammering so violently that I feared it would reduce my ribcage to splintered fragments as a woman emerged from the shadows. Though I dearly wish I could forget her, I believe the terrible image of that woman will haunt my memory forever. Her long, dark hair dragged across the porch's decrepit boards, wildly tangled and rife with knots, the size of a fist. A tattered lace gown hung loosely on a wiry frame, so consumed by mildew and stains that I couldn't determine what color it had once been before decaying into a murky shade of blotchy, rotted brown. The woman's sinewy hands were a jarring display of gnarled fingers, veins like plump worms and pallid flesh that appeared paper-thin, as if even delicate touch would cause her skin to rupture open and weep something far more loathsome than blood. But it was her face that terrified me the most. The woman's features were contorted into a violent expression of venomous, frightening hatred, as if an inconceivable rage pounded through her veins. Spittle frothed on her colorless lips when she contorted her mouth into a snarl so furious that it bordered on animalistic. The woman's reddened eyes burned with viperous rage as she fixed her gaze on me before staggering off the porch and into the tall grass, her every movement seething with murderous intent. A stifled scream rattled inside of my frozen throat. The woman was soon close enough for me to see the dried blood caked beneath her cracked, sickly yellow fingernails. I wanted to tell her that I'd never set foot on her property again, that I'd leave and never come back if she spared me from whatever hideous doom she planned to inflict on me. But instead I stood there mutely and gazed into the infuriated visage entirely devoid of mercy. Suddenly a hand seized the back of my shirt and roughly pulled me backwards. Run! Joe shouted frantically. Now! In the blink of an eye, we were racing down the path, nearly tripping over our own frantic feet as we ran beneath a sky that at last erupted into a downpour. Rain fell heavily and threatened to transform the ground into a slick carpet of mud. Why did you open the door? I shrieked in a tone shrill with incredible fear. I don't know! Joe yelled back, her voice teetering on the edge of hysterical sobs. I didn't mean to do it! All of a sudden, my hand was on the doorknob, but... Ah! A startled cry tore from Joe's lips when she tripped over an exposed tree root and began to fall. Sometimes, on the nights where sleep is particularly elusive, and there's nothing to distract me from the painful memories swimming throughout my mind, I close my eyes and hear the cracking sound of Joe's skull slamming into a moss-covered rock as she landed in a motionless, silent heap. Joe! I gasped when I rolled her over and saw the blood trickling down her scalp. Joe's eyes were closed. Her chest was rising and falling with each feeble breath she took. I desperately tried to wake Joe before attempting to pick her up, only to discover that her limp body was too heavy for me to carry. All the while, I never stopped hearing the persistent, menacing footsteps heading towards us. I've got to go find help, I whispered shakily. I promise I'll come back for you. Tears streamed down my cheeks as I dragged Joe's unconscious form into a cluster of shrubs, concealing her within a leafy foliage until not even a patch of her clothing was visible. Then I ran. By the time I reached my house, I was sopping wet with rain and sweat. Sobs wrecked my body as I called my mother, who in turn called the cops. A succession of police cars soon descended upon the dirt road. Nobody believed me, of course. 
Not when I told two somber-faced officers everything that had happened as my shocked parents sat beside me on our couch and wore matching expressions of horrified confusion. Not when the police repeatedly drove me up and down the dirt road whilst instructing me to point out where the path was. And not when I couldn't find it again no matter how hard I tried. The trail had inexplicably vanished into thin air without leaving behind so much as a trodden blade of grass to mark where it had been a short time ago. That night, I lied awake in bed and listened to the inconsolable wails of Joe's weeping mother drifting hauntingly through the rainy air. I heard Joe's name being called out over and over again as several Cranesville townsfolk gathered to search for her. But despite their valiant efforts, they failed to uncover any trace of Joe. The searches continued for weeks, and each time the results were always the same. They never found Joanna. We moved away a month later. A fresh start, my mother called it. But I dragged grief and guilt behind me everywhere I went. I blamed myself for Joe's disappearance. And to this day, I still do. I often wonder how our lives would have turned out if I'd never met Joe. Perhaps she would have grown up to be a famous artist. And perhaps I would have become anything but a hollow shell of a person that I am today. Many years have passed since that fateful afternoon. And I've spent each one mired in self-hatred and ceaseless regret. I constantly think of Joe and my unforgivable failure to save her. But I think I can finally make it right. You see... Tonight, I had an urge to take a drive. Much has changed about Cranesville. Most of the small shops have been replaced by popular chains. The local library appears to have undergone renovations, and there's a supermarket where the movie theater once stood. But as I drove down the dirt road leading to my former home, I spotted a recognizable sight, something I never thought I'd see again. The path has reappeared. My own existence disappoints me. I've abandoned all the hopes and dreams I once had. I work a dead-end job that I inherently despise, and I have no companion to speak of. I'm no longer afraid to walk in the forest, even if the withered woman remains there. Her infernal rage cannot compare to the unbearable weariness and pain that I have carried with me for so very long. I hope that I found my best friend right where I left her. Somehow, frozen in time and still unawake, waiting for me to fulfill the promise I made on that long ago summer day. This time I won't leave without her. I believe the path I'm about to walk is meant for me alone. If I never return, I don't think you'll be able to find me. Know that I am without fear and that I am finally ready to face whatever awaits me at the end. And if you should ever find yourself wandering down a secluded road, surrounded by a broad forest or a lonely stretch of woods, be sure to glance out into the trees before you pass them by. Perhaps there's a path meant for you, too. Where the Birches Lean by Locked334. It was the last week of school before Christmas break. That meant that the students and teachers of Ridgecrest Christian Preparatory Academy had little intention of actually working. Most classes had become a social hour, but Mr. Winthrop had decided to take this opportunity to give his senior English class a writing assignment. He requested that each student write a two-page essay detailing their holiday traditions the class groaned in their displeasure. All of them except the golden boy, Jeremy Bascom. Jeremy Bascom was perfect. Perfect blonde hair, blue eyes, and pearly white smile. The kind of boy you wanted your daughter to date. Jeremy would credit this to being perfectly made by his lord and saviour. His one annoying quality was the need to remind everyone of his faith and the pitfalls of anyone who did not believe in it. 
Jeremy and his small group of like-minded friends were quick to correct anyone who thought different, and enjoyed any opportunity to spread the message of their faith. It was a walking and talking reminder of what it meant to be Christian. Everything about him showed it, all the way down to the golden cross that was permanently pinned to his polo shirts. So, when given the task of writing about the reason for the season, Jeremy was more than enthused. He did have one question, however. What should those of us write about who do not celebrate Christmas? Jeremy remarked while glaring across the room toward the pale and dark-haired girl in the corner of the room. Emma Campbell responded with a sneer and a raised middle finger. It was no secret that Emma did not believe in God, but teenage rumors had spread that she practiced the dark arts of witchcraft. The truth was, the only thing Emma knew of spells and magic were the stories her grandmother had told her about the old days in Scotland. As a child, she would sit, her green eyes wide as her ancestor told of the druids performing rituals to summon the power of their gods. Her favorite was one of justice, a humble servant saved from torture by the power of the gods, having turned their assailant into a simple birch tree. She would beg her grandmother to tell the story, and each time her grandmother would assure her that the place full of birch trees was real. Emma had never actually witnessed magic, though. It was only day-to-day -day rituals that her mother still performed out of habit. There was always incense burning, and a blessing before the day would begin. The type of thing that was hardly any different than lighting candle or saying a prayer. The only real reason Emma even attended a Christian school was the academic benefit it afforded. She contemplated her grandmother's many stories and began writing. If Mr. W wanted to know about tradition, she would write about the winter solstice as she had been taught. Mr. Winthrop had to calm the chuckles of his class before answering. Everyone has traditions, not just Christians, and I am interested in reading about all of them. So, please give me your best work. When the bell rang to signal the end of the period, the room went from silent scribbling noises to a clamor of shuffling seats. Mr. Winthrop raised his voice in an attempt to remind them all that the assignment would be due before each of them left for the holidays. Few of them were paying any attention, however. Emma was the last to exit the room, much like always, and quietly navigated between the hordes of teenagers within the hall. When she approached her locker, Jeremy Bascom and his goons had congregated around it. She sighed, knowing that she would have to endure a lecture to gain access to her belongings. Jeremy's smirk made her sick, despite how perfect his teeth were. Please just let me get to my locker. Emma begged. Jeremy leaned forward. First, let me see what you're writing for Mr. W's class. Emma's eyes rolled as she felt her notebook pull free from her hands. She yelled for it to be returned, but the group had quickly surrounded Jeremy. They hovered over the pages and read about a celebration of the winter solstice, a joyous time of giving, decoration, and feast. Emma had been taught a long time ago that many of the Christian traditions had been borrowed from pagan ones and adapted to form what we know as Christmas. She watched as Jeremy's face changed from amusement to anger with each passing word. Emma knew that within Jeremy's mind she was a sinner, a blasphemer, and doomed to the pits of hell. She could even see it in his eyes when he finally looked at her. God does not like it when we spread lies, especially about him. Jeremy said as he began tearing the pages from Emma's notebook. Emma's voice roared. They aren't lies! They're the stories my grandmother used to tell me! The girl refused to give him the satisfaction of seeing her cry. She held strong to her tears that wished to flow from her eyes as the notebook was shoved back into her hands. This was something Emma had become accustomed to. The group dispersed as the next bell rang, and though she should have made her way to class... Her heart was no longer in it. Instead, she made her way to the restroom and sat within the stall to release her sorrow drop by drop into her palms. In that tiny space, she found herself beseeching the gods of her grandmother to save her from this pain. Emma hoped that the god of revenge, Aaron, could come swooping in and teach Jeremy Bascom a lesson. That night, Emma's sleep was restless. Her mind was still filled with the tortures of the day and wished of a solution. It took her hours to find peace, but once she had, she found dreams also. 
she found herself walking amongst stark white birch trees. A pale blue gown of cotton and lace draped over a thin frame, and Lily sat like a crown upon her hand. The air was warm and sweet, the birds chirped overhead, and the wind played a tune that reminded her of the music her grandmother used to play. Soon she found herself amidst a clearing, and within the center sat two ghostly-looking hounds with bright red eyes. They sat intent, watching as she approached them and made no movement toward her. From beyond the trees, a figure appeared in black. A hood covered scattered strands of grey as the person hobbled upon a cane toward the clearing. As the person stopped besides the dogs, a frail and withered hand pushed back the hood to reveal the wrinkle and worn face of an old crone. Her eyes were glassy, much like that of the sightless, but she stared intently at Emma as if she were peering into her very soul. The woman gave a gentle smile and reached out her hand to brush at Emma's cheek. The woman's smell was of fresh grass and the sensation was calming. She felt like a child again, being soothed by her grandmother when she was in pain. Young one, do not despair. We see you. The woman spoke softly. A tear rolled from one of Emma's eyes as she spoke. Who are you? A friend of your family, dearie. You can call me Matilda. Is this the place my grandmother told me about? Matilda nodded. This place is full of magic, and if you believe, you will witness it. And with those words... Small specks of light erupted from the flowers beneath Emma's feet. They danced within the air around her body, and a sound like tiny voices singing echoed in her ears. It was soft and soothing like a lullaby. Her eyes began to flutter, and her knees became weak. Emma knelt within the soft grass and found herself lying down within the poppies. The sweet smell of the flowers, the calming song, and the comforting ground beneath her lulled her to sleep. Her body lay still whilst the old crone and her hounds disappeared into the birches beyond the clearing, humming a tune from a time long since past. Emma did not stir the rest of the night, and a smile rested on her lips. The following day, Emma felt rejuvenated. It was almost as if every weight of the world she lived in had been lifted from her shoulders. There was even a sparkle in those emerald eyes, a light that not even the heckling from Jeremy and his friends could dim. Their laughter faded into the distance as she thought about her dream. It left the group confused, especially Jeremy. A seed of curiosity was planted at that moment. Jeremy had to know why Emma seemed so at peace. Before he had completely thought about his actions, his feet were moving. He picked up the pace until he was walking in stride with Emma. What's got you in such a good mood? He quizzed. Emma smirked. Wouldn't you like to know? She disappeared into a biology class, and when Jeremy followed, Mrs. Simmons stopped him and questioned if he might be lost. Jeremy did not share this class with Emma. As she took her seat, she gave a slight giggle at the sight of the boy being escorted from the room. Even if Jeremy had not properly received his punishment for being so cruel, it was good enough to improve Emma's mood. Her notebook was filled with doodles of dancing fairies, flowers, and rows of birch trees. She could not get the image of her dream out of her head, and just thinking of Matilda made her smile, and something about that upset Jeremy. He could not get Emma out of his head. Emma's smile was like an itch Jeremy could not scratch. He was distracted by it for the rest of the day, and during his evening meal with his family. Normally, he was enthusiastic about sharing the events of school with his father and mother, but tonight, he asked to be excused early. Jeremy changed for bed, hoping that a good night's rest would ease his inner turmoil, but as soon as he shut his eyes, Emma's face awaited him. Her wavy brown hair, sparkling green eyes, and supple pink lips haunted him. He tossed and turned, adjusting his pillows, and fought with his own imagination for hours before finally finding sleep. His mind could not let go of the image, and it slowly crept its way into his dreams. Jeremy awoke, laying in a bed of grass surrounded by poppies. The cool night air whipped through the birch trees that circled the clearing, and the only light was that of the moon above. 
he brought his body up slightly, resting his weight on his elbows. From the forest beyond, a form approached. As the thin figure stepped out into the moonlight, he recognized Emma's face. She slowly approached, grasping hold of the hem of her pale blue gown. She knelt beside him and whispered his name. He stared at her mouth, noticing how red and plump they seemed almost like an apple. She leaned down, pressing those very lips against his, and he could not resist pressing back into her loving kiss. He could hear singing echoes through the trees around him, and specks of light danced around them, shining like tiny stars. It was magical. He felt her hand trail down his body, then come to a rest between his legs. His eyes widened as her palm rubbed at the cloth that separated their skin. He knew what he was doing was wrong, but it felt so good. His body reacted in kind, his manhood growing firm under her touch. She smiled at the sensation, then leaned back, retracting her hand in order to pull gently at the bindings that held her gown in place. The cloth lowered to reveal her naked form beneath. Jeremy's mouth hung agape as his eyes trailed her perky breasts and smooth skin. He had never witnessed the female body before, and his excitement only grew. The beautiful young woman before him pulled down upon his pants, revealing his rigidness before taking him inside her. Her body rocked slowly atop his lap, gasping in pleasure. Jeremy laid back upon the soft grass and moaned with every motion. Within moments, he could no longer hold in his ecstasy and released himself inside of her. Emma came to abrupt halt as she felt his fluids fill her. Her smile slowly crooked into a smirk as she lifted her pale form off of him. She pulled her gown back up and over her shoulders and bound the strapping. She bent slightly, kissing Jeremy on his forehead before pressing her index finger to his lips, as if telling him to keep this a secret. Then, just as quickly as she had arrived, she disappeared into the birches. Jeremy was left soaked in his own sweat and juices in the middle of the clearing. He jerked awake to find himself still in bed. It had all been a dream. He spent the next few moments asking for forgiveness for his lustful thoughts and prayed for the strength to ignore them if they were to return. Emma's smile failed to leave her as the rest of the week progressed and it tortured Jeremy to no end. Every time his eyes fell upon her, all he could think of was his dream and being inside of her. He prayed more in the days that followed than he ever had before. He prayed for relief from the torment, but it did not come. When he could stand it no longer, he found his way to Emma's locker and waited. When she arrived to retrieve her things at the end of the day, Jeremy stood tapping his foot impatiently. His hair was a mess, his eyes were dark, and almost resembled an addict that had not had his fix in a few days. Rough couple of days? Jeremy tried to smile. You could say that. You mind if I get to my locker? Emma questioned. Jeremy quickly stepped to the side. Yeah, sure, uh, so, um, the thing is, I was wondering if you might want to, um, you know, Emma giggled slightly, listening to the stammering of the boy. Spit it out, I gotta get going. Jeremy attempted to steal himself, his eyes getting more serious. Will you go out with me? Emma could hardly contain her laughter. It erupted from her mouth and echoed through the hallway. She had no words to properly respond. Jeremy attempted to laugh as well, but he could not find the humor in his question. He needed her to say yes. He asked again, but she simply ignored the question and closed her locker. Emma made her way down the hall with Jeremy following close behind. Tears formed in his eyes as he began to beg, and at one point, he even got down on his knees. The sight was truly pathetic, and when it only offered another laugh from Emma's lips, he became angry. He stood abruptly and grabbed her by the arm and demanded she go out on a date with him. Take your hands off her right now! Mr. Winthrop's voice boomed from down the hall. Jeremy's fingers shot open, releasing his hold on her arm in a second. Emma was shocked at Jeremy's actions, but even more frightened of the look in his eyes. She could see madness behind those eyes. She did not hesitate to step back and head toward the door. 
Within moments, she was out the door and on her bus. Jeremy was left defeated in the hallway, wondering how he could have been led to this madness. He only had one answer. Emma must have cast a spell on him, and he would have to break it. That was the only way for him to return to his sanity and possibly save his soul from damnation. The plot began to form in his head as he exited the building and sat in his car. His tires poured smoke as he peeled out of the parking lot and down the road towards home. The next day, Emma had made it a point to avoid Jeremy, which she found to be easy because he had not attended classes that day. She just had to make it until the end of school, and they would be out for the holidays. She could not help but wonder what had possessed Jeremy to act the way he did, and that thought clouded her mind most of the day. She stared at his empty seat in Mr. Winthrop's class, which the teacher had noticed. When the bell rang, he asked Emma to stay behind to question her about the incident, which she had fewer answers than even the teacher. Emma had wanted Jeremy punished for how cruel he had been to her all these years, but now she felt as though it had gone too far. Even as much as she wanted to see him suffer, she still felt pity for Jeremy. When Emma arrived home, her mother was descending the stairs from the attic. Emma flashed her normal smile and asked what her mother had been doing. Normally, cleaning out the house was safe for springtime, but something had possessed her to bring down some items that had been stored away. Dust filled the air as Emma's mother opened a trunk that held the only remaining items that her grandmother had donned. Several of the books that held those stories Emma remembered from her childhood were piled to the side. The rest were tattered garments, and tucked beneath them was an old jewelry box. Emma knelt by the trunk and pulled the things from it with her mother. Her eyes widened as she revealed a light blue gown that resembled the one in a dream. Your grandmother loved that dress. Emma's mother beamed. Emma held the garment to her body and noticed it was her size. Do you think I could keep this? I don't see why not. There's no way I'm fitting into that thing. Her mother laughed as she opened the jewelry box. Emma went upstairs to try on the dress. She slipped out of the ratty jeans and t-shirt she had become accustomed to wearing to school and slid the soft fabric over her shoulders. She reached behind her and tied the straps in place before stepping over to the full-length mirror by her window. She smiled at the sight, feeling more beautiful than she ever had. At that moment, her mother stepped into the doorway and leaned against the doorframe to admire the lovely young woman her daughter had become. When Emma noticed her mother watching, she gave a laugh and twirled in the gown. Her mother wiped a tear from her eye and revealed what she had found within the jewelry box. It was a silver necklace with a star-shaped pendant. Within the center of the star was what her grandmother used to call a rune. Her mother told her that it was the one piece of jewelry that her grandmother always wore. She thought it protected her, and as Emma's mother placed it around her neck, she hoped it would protect her daughter just the same. The girl took the trinket between her index and thumb, rubbing it gently and thinking of her grandmother's smiling face. A car sat idle across the street. Jeremy Bascom stared from the driver's seat, his eyes intent upon the open window of Emma's bedroom. He had watched as she changed into the dress, and it only served to make him angrier. It felt as though he was being tortured little by little, as he was unsure of how much more he could take. He watched and waited as the light of the moon illuminated the night. His eyes were intent on that window, until the light went out, and he was sure everyone inside would be asleep. He stepped from his car and quietly approached the front yard, gathering small pebbles in his hand to prepare them to hurl them at Emma's window to get her attention. The sound of tapping caused Emma to stir. She had fallen asleep in her grandmother's gown and felt foolish for still having it on. The tapping came again and caused her to turn to the window. She watched as another small fragment collided with the window pane. She eased from her bed and slowly made her way to the wall. Jeremy was readying another rock when he noticed her face. He smiled and waved from the ground. Emma unlatched the window and eased it open in order to lean out. Jeremy, what the heck are you doing here? She whispered in an annoyed tone. Sorry for coming over so late, but I wanted to apologize for the other day. Jeremy responded, trying to remain quiet as well. 
Emma rolled her eyes. Yeah, we'll apologize and get out of here. Come on, Jeremy begged. At least let me say it face to face. You keep it up and my parents are going to wake up. And trust me, you do not want my dad to catch you out here. Just come down and let me say what I need to say to you and you won't see me again. Fine, Emma huffed. Go around back though. They'll hear me if I open the front door. Jeremy almost leaped with excitement as he rounded the house and headed towards the back porch. Emma leaned back in and shut the window. As she headed to the door, she looked at herself in the mirror one more time. She grasped her grandmother's pendant and said a little prayer for protection. She hoped that whatever had been watching out for her would continue to do so. She then crept down the stairs and through the kitchen towards the back door. Her eyes scanned the porch but could not see Jeremy. Her fingers slowly disengaged the lock and turned the knob whilst easing the door open. She called out quietly into the night but received no response. Jeremy! This isn't funny! As she stepped out onto the porch, she noticed how bright the moon was. If you don't cut it out, I'm going to go back inside. Her words were cut short as a cloth-covered hand clamped down across her mouth. A scent of a strong chemical engulfed her nose and her head began to spin. Her limbs suddenly felt weak as she fell back into Jeremy's arms. He was speaking to her, but the words were distant and muffled. It was followed by a maddening grin just before everything went black. While unconscious, her grandmother came to her in a vision, whispering softly for her to be strong and remember the birches. When Emma came to, she found her mouth shut with part of her gown. It had been ripped into pieces and tied firmly across her lips. She tried to scream for help, but the trees around her were unfamiliar. Jeremy had apparently transported her deep into the wooded area behind her house, and at this time of night, no one would hear her. It did not take long for the salty specks to stain her cheeks. She had no idea what Jeremy had in store for her, but she knew it could not be good. Jeremy let out a flurry of curses, and he stopped dead in his tracks. Emma's eyes scanned the trees, hoping that maybe he had seen someone else in the woods. That was when she noticed the stark white row of birch trees. Jeremy walked forward, avoiding the ghostly white trees around him. Within moments, he found himself in the middle of a clearing that was only lit by that full moon above. Poppies scattered across the ground in front of him, and it did not take long for either of them to recognize their location. Emma had never known there to be a place like this in the woods behind her home, but she had not ventured far before. She wondered if the old woman would appear again to save her, but that thought was dashed when Jeremy slung her body to the ground. She tried to yell for help again, but the back of Jeremy's hand silenced her quickly. He searched the area frantically as if looking for something. When he did not find what he was looking for, he turned back to Emma. What did you do to me? She tried to respond, but the gag prevented it. At this point, her eyes were swollen from the constant sobbing. Within her head, she was begging for help from anyone or anything that could save her. Jeremy approached, wild-eyed as he tugged at his belt buckle. It did not take long for Emma to realize his intention. Jeremy pulled down his pants as she tried to crawl away. In moments, his body was on top of her, and he was trying to pull out her underwear. She could smell the warm breath bursting from his mouth. Jeremy had been drinking. She wriggled and squirmed, and grasped at Jeremy's face in an attempt to fight him off, but he was simply too strong. She begged for him to stop through the gag. You have warped my mind and perverted it. You have torn me away from God's grace. Jeremy's saliva scattered across her face as he yelled. You are an evil and spiteful witch, and it is time you were punished for cursing me with this. You do not deserve to be saved. His voice growled mere inches from Emma's nose. Emma knew if she did not do something, Jeremy would have his way with her and there was no telling what he would do after that. She clawed at his face but received his knuckles in her mouth in return. Her gums spilled crimson liquid across her once pink lips. She screamed in agony. She tried to hold onto her grandmother's gown as Jeremy began to claw at her breasts. She could feel his hardness pressing against her, and there was little time left. That was when she felt the pendant around her neck. 
She grasped it tightly in her hand and shoved it forward. The hard edge of the silver cut a gash above Jeremy's eye. Blood poured from the wound as he cried out in pain. Jeremy stumbled back, holding his head and cursing Emma's name. She crawled backwards on her elbows and feet before removing the gag and finally attempting to get to her feet. She stumbled and watched Jeremy fall back against one of the birch trees. He propped himself up with one hand, the blood from his forehead staining the white bark. The look in his eyes had not left him. His intent was still true. In his mind, he would have Emma and there would be nothing and no one that would stop him. He lurched forward, but was drawn back by the hand that rested on the tree. It was stuck, almost as if glued to the wood. Small specks of light rose from the grass and began to dance around the clearing. Small specks of light rose from the grass and began to dance around the clearing. A song drifted through the wind and suddenly Emma felt safe. Jeremy's blood continued to flow from his cut, across his neck, and down his arm. It almost melded with the bark and began to fade into it. The blood became white and rigid along with his fingers. They both watched as inch by inch his skin turned into wood. When the truth of the situation became clear to Jeremy, he looked back toward Emma, his face no longer full of anger, but instead replaced with fear. Emma's mouth opened, and her voice emitted words of which she had never spoken, and yet seemed to understand. It was a dialect that her grandmother would sometimes use when telling her stories. Le kamak Darwin, cure me du droka there, and say lays na creoban bathson. Help me! He yelled as his arm became one with the tree. Emma simply turned away from the horrible sight, and looked towards the path they had taken to enter. The old crone stood at the edge of the birches with her two pale hands. Her index finger was pressed to her lips as if telling the girl to keep their secret. When Emma looked back, all that remained of Jeremy was his other hand. The fingers were still reaching out for help as the white bark engulfed them. Each digit became small branches of the newly formed tree. It leaned outward from the tree beside it, still trying to flee, but there was no use. The deed was done. The tree was unrecognizable from the other split-formed birches in the area. Emma turned and witnessed just how many similar birches encircled the area. She wondered if each and every one had been someone to cross her family. She looked back in hopes of thanking the old woman for her help, but she and her pets were gone. The fair-skinned girl who had escaped a fate worse than death slowly made her way back home as the first snowflakes of winter began to coat the ground. As the months passed, the mystery of Jeremy's disappearance had faded from popular conversation. The authorities assumed he simply ran away. Emma was the only one who knew different. So, when the green sprouts pushed through dead leaves, she made her way to the woods. She hummed a tune from long ago, twirling in the repaired fabric of her grandmother's gown. Fat yellow jackets floated in the warm breeze, and the air smelled of poppies while she skimmed through the brush. Her bare feet were cushioned by the soft grass, and her skin was warmed by the springtime air she found the clearing. Her lips curled into a smile as she found where the birches lean. She knelt beside the tree and thanked the gods once again. Bison Ridge by Tuawe You awake at the crack of dawn. Fragrant scents of nature flow into your nostrils on a fair breeze. You return the now moistened and hot gust back into the air. As you stand, your eyes take in the early dawn horizon, rolling plains, distant yet stoic mountains, and luscious grass unfold below you as you watch the sun's golden rays cascade over the landscape. Nearby, you hear the babbling of rushing water. Cool, crisp, and refreshing. 
A sudden snort followed by a huff attracts your attention to the mate lying next to you. She's still embraced in slumber. As you appreciate the beautiful coat that shrouds your partner and their marvelous physique, you wonder why it is you are expected to take any other cows as mates. The rest of the herd begins to stir. You can't help but question why your fellow bulls stay so far from the female herd. It all seems so unnecessary. The routine resumes as you witness a large, dark brown patch begin to move in the distance. The other males are getting some breakfast already. As others begin to graze locally for their morning meal, your ears twitch in the cool morning air. You know the time has come to begin to head down south to warmer locales, but that alone isn't what catches your thoughts. A faint rumbling tickles your inner ear. There are no telltale signs of a storm, so what could this be? You have a nagging instinct that something is very wrong. As the smartest member of your community, you decide that it's worth investigating. You reach the peak of a nearby vista, your hulking form obscured by small foliage and shrubs. To the west, you can see the large and expensive drop-off cliff, relatively far in the distance. You begin to scour the land for any signs of anomalies. No sign of wolves, who usually tend to strike when the herd is on the move, trying to isolate individuals. Your recognition of techniques has saved countless calves. Mountain lions are more devious, but you've not seen one recently, not since the herd passed the plains. The rumbling grows in volume and intensity as you begin to hear strange cries and yelps. Whinnies and roars whip the cacophony into an offensive choir. You turn to check the lower flatlands to the southeast. Rarely, if ever, do you see much go down or come up from there. This time is different. A massive cloud of dust chokes the landscape, tailing a large group of strange creatures. They stand what appears to be slightly taller than a bison, have two separate heads, and run on four legs. One long head protrudes from the center of the creature's back and has some disturbing flailing appendages. They're coming toward the herd. As you turn to make your way back down the hill, you spot part of one of these creatures much closer. It's separated in two forms that have been silently watching. How did you not notice them before? They combine back into one horrific amalgamation like the others and begin to head for the other side of the cows. Your heart pounds, your mind races, and your fur stands on end. This is more sinister than a mountain lion, far more threatening than a pack of wolves. There's an order to their movement. They're calculated. Racing down the hill, you let loose a bellow, attempting to alert your fellow bison. Slowly, they gain a fractional grasp of the situation and begin to flee west, away from the predators. You know it's not in the nature of your fellows to make a stand, but the female herd will be jeopardized if the males don't help. Unfortunately, as you turn your attention towards the boars, you see that they too are being pursued by a mob of abominations. Sharp twangs sporadically interrupt the now all-encompassing thunder of hooves, accompanied by small puffs of some kind of dark air, chuffing out the flailing limbs of the beast's second head. Finally, you catch up to the female herd. The creatures have split their group, half on either side, as if they're trying to control all movement. The cows are terrified, and follow the malicious path set out. You recall what lies in wait beyond the western approach. Speeding ahead of the females, you attempt to veer them off course, stop them, or otherwise do anything you can to halt the progress of their doomed forced march. It's no use. The ladies are too afraid. It's panic and chaos. In desperation, you charge the group of predators, disrupting their path. Some of the creatures separate into their split forms as they fall. Others change direction and attempt to loop back around. You feel a soft, spongy mass under your hooves, accompanied by a snapping and crunching as one of the split creatures cries out below your warpath. Hope fills your mind. Perhaps you can gain the upper hand. If the other balls charge the monsters, we have... Your heart sinks as you watch the male herd driven headlong, en masse over the cliff's edge, farther to the south. Brothers, sons, reduced to nothing. For the first time, your sense of duty wanes as the pit of your stomach drops 
and a sinking sensation takes your heart. Fear has begun to root. Desperate for any kind of resolution, you turn back to the female herd to help however you can. But it's too late. Their chaotic, terrified charge has turned into a deadly dive. As you watch the last of your kind shed their lives over the horizon, all hope for your herd dwindles into little more than memories. Rage begins to burn within you, facing the monsters who now trot back and forth as they divide into smaller groups. You release a bellow of gargantuan proportions. This may be the end of your herd, but you will not go down so easily. The thick hard plate of your skull connects with one of the abominations, which lets out a screeching wail as it collapses. You hear before you feel, the sharp twangs return, all around you, from all directions. Like deep, sinking teeth cutting into your flesh, they burn with agony. Trying to resist the pain to power through, you attempt another charge, but your body begins to fail. Your strength wanes. You begin to slow. Finally, as you collapse forward, then roll on your side, you know this to be your end. Why have they done this? Why have they slaughtered us? As your vision begins to darken and the pain numbs, you hear their guttural convoluted speech. Well, there's one less meal for them red-skinned Indians. Hunger Hill by the Littlest Fear In more rural parts of New England, a strange legend began to develop around a stretch of woodlands known as Hunger Hill. It is a place where nothing grows, a place that stays grey and solemn even on the brightest and warmest of days, filled with rotting, gnarled trees and long, pale grasses that seem to sway on a non-existent breeze. Many would argue that it is a place that exists in a darkness of its own. It is a legend mostly known to paranormal enthusiasts and those interested in the many mysteries and hidden creatures surrounding New England. It is a story that is also known to the inhabitants of a small town that have long since lived under it, but one that they avoid talking of from fear. People report bizarre phenomena when visiting the area. Cameras malfunction when trying to take pictures, often being damaged irreparably soon after. If you travel deep enough into the woods, you'll know when you get to Hunger Hill. There are no animals that live near the area. Animals such as dogs that find themselves in the area go into a state of hysteria. They tug at their leashes, trying desperately to lead their owners away. There have been some cases of dogs becoming so frenzied near the area that they have bolted into the trees, only to be found later, entangled in the branches by their leashes, having hung themselves in their panic to flee. It gets its usual name from our torrid history, one is equally shrouded in shadows and darkness. In the land of phantoms, Hunger Hill was long since considered the threshold to the spirit world. It was a place that seemed to writhe and seethe with such an unseen evil that the native tribes refused to settle anywhere near it. They said that it was not their land, but belonged to the Pale Men, spirits who inhabited it. In the early 17th century, a Puritan family settled there, composed of a father, a wife, two daughters and three sons. They were good and God-fearing people who only wanted to build a better life for themselves in this new world. They refused to believe in any spirits or evil that dwelt within the area, believing that God would protect them from such heathen beliefs. But as they soon learned, God had abandoned those parts of his creation long ago. After a bitter winter, the family were all found slaughtered within their house. They were described as if being set upon by wild beasts of sorts. Their bodies were covered in horrific wounds and teeth marks much smaller than any bear or wolf, but as powerful to have bit down to the bone. 
All were found brutally dealt with, except the family's eldest son. His body was nowhere to be found on the property. A warrant was immediately put out by the community for his arrest and hanging, blaming him for the brutal murder of his family. But the snow and winds prevented the men from embarking on such a sufficient search party, as well as a deep superstition of the area and the wood devils purported to be lurking within, white, almost humanoid creatures who screamed at night, their shrill, inhuman voices running through the town. They never found any trace of him, so they presumed him to be dead, and life went on as normal in the village, although with an added new fear of the woods on the outskirts. Although the story of the family soon faded into local legend, Mothers used the story to ward their children away from those woods. Despite their good intentions, there was still the odd few who vanished whilst playing too deep there, never to be seen again. But the ones who fell most afoul of the area, aside from the few curious children foolish enough to wander, were strangers, people new to the area and ignorant of the fear that surrounded Hunger Hill. In 1928, a man by the name of Otto Barr came to the town. He was the son of two East German-born immigrants, and a writer who wanted to compile a book on the mysteries of New England. He had heard of the mysterious story that surrounded the area, and become fascinated enough to travel there and research it. Despite the concerns of the locals, he ventured up into the area alone. When the evening had left on turned to night, and night became day, then two nights, the police were contacted. They compiled an extensive search of the surrounding woodlands, but it seemed as if the unfortunate man's body had vanished without a trace from the face of the earth. Only a few of his earthly possessions were found, tattered strips of cloth, later identified by his widow as being torn from the back of the jacket he had been wearing. His spectacles, found half buried in fallen leaves, and a journal. He had been using it for research, but most of the pages had fallen out from the time the police found it. Two miles away from the area Otto had last been seen. A last, frenzied entry had been scribbled inside. I hear them scream at night. They scream so loudly that my ears might burst. I scream now too, in hopes that God might save me from this place, but nothing is as the same. I have passed the same tree five times now, but I am still no closer to the village. It has been three days. Food and water is rapidly becoming scarce. The hideous man roots. I see their forms dance between the trees, pale shadows. In the day, they whisper to me terrible things. God, why won't they stop screaming? The police determined that the unfortunate man, unfamiliar to the area, had become lost and delirious, eventually succumbing to the elements before being picked off by woodland predators. The investigation was eventually closed, due to lack of evidence and the fact that Barr was not a local, and therefore less of a priority to look for, leaving no consolation to his grieving widow or family. But the most famous incident came in 1983. In the years that have followed, it has almost become as legendary as the family of settlers who perished there. It had became the stuff of hushed ghost stories in the drunken corners of taverns and in high school locker rooms across New England. The circumstances have been stretched and exaggerated to the point that it's almost laughable, but the truth remains untouched. Five college-aged friends ventured into the forest on a hiking trip one summer. Being relative novices to the pastime, they managed to stray off the intended path and wander into those dead woodlands. In time, they had become hopelessly lost. Far from any payphones or forest ranger's office, they were forced to make camp for the night. 
It was at night they heard the noises. Horrible, high-pitched cries of something that they tried to convince themselves was a coyote. But coyote howls did not sound like the hideous sounds they heard that night in those woods. After all, coyotes certainly don't sound like human screaming. They tried again the next morning to rejoin civilization, their nerves already frayed from the previous night, but as far as they seemed to wander, they always found themselves at the exact spot they had wandered from. Tempers were already beginning to fray, their supplies were already dwindling. At night, the screaming would return, even louder than before, to the point they could barely sleep. In their tiredness, the group began to hallucinate. Some swore that they saw dashes of white, pale people running between the trees, watching them in the daylight. Most versions of the tale vary on what comes next. Either the hapless students were picked off by the creatures that they saw lurking in those woods, or one of their own was driven insane by the lack of food and the stretching loneliness of the place, and had slaughtered their friends. However, the one thing that was definite was that not one of the five returned from those woods. A search of the area found their supplies scattered around, as if they were running from something and had dropped them on the way, as well as the tattered remains of the makeshift tent they had pitched. There seemed to be no signs of a struggle or anything violent. It was as if they had just vanished into the air. It was agreed that they had succumbed to the elements because of their own lack of preparation, and the case was closed quickly. The five were officially listed as missing people. Few wondered why the case had been so suddenly and mysteriously swept under the rug, out of the media sight. But there were times that the townsfolk below would just look up at the darkened trees and wonder. In 2005, when a nature photographer was trying to take some good shots of the woodlands of New England for an ecological magazine, not far from Hunger Hill. While fixing his tripod against the thick roots of a large, looming grey tree, his foot stumbled against something sharp in the soil. It caught his attention, and looking closer, saw it was part of a human phalange. Police were immediately called to the scene. On excavating the area, they made a startling discovery. Entwined within the thick roots, deep within the earth were over a dozen skeletons, their flesh long since picked clean off their bones. They were enchained together, each one clutching the other's ankles as if they were being pulled down by something. Some had been buried so long that the roots of the tree were growing through their bones. The five skeletons at the top of the chain were later identified as the people who went missing 22 years earlier. How they came to be buried within the earth, and by whom, is still a mystery. No one could explain either why all their mouths were twisted into silent screams as they clutched desperately upwards, as if trying to break through the soil. The other skeletons found within the pit remained unidentified, but it was discovered they were in varying states of decomposition, suggesting they were down there for much longer than the missing five. Some were even dating back to the 17th century. The chain stretched 12 feet into the earth, taking more than a week to be uncovered. Entangled with the adults were several smaller skeletons, ones that were obviously those of children. Due to the bizarre circumstances, the authorities kept the discovery secret to avoid disturbing the local community. The missing persons case was quietly reopened, where it remains until this day. It has been said that everything will eventually return to the earth, at a time where our skin withers from age, and our bones are no longer warmed by the sun where at the dulling of our existence, we complete the great cycle, ensuring rebirth through our own demise. That is just the way things are, and have always been. But perhaps we don't wait for our bodies to return to the earth. Perhaps the earth is waiting for us, 
in the hidden shadows cast by the light, ready to pull us back down into the soil where all good souls eventually come to rest. That the earth hungers, as we all do, for the warmth of a presence within its cold hearth of soil, that holds the same hunger that humans have for companionship, that it finds the few and unwary watching them from afar, before pulling them down into the darkness, where their screams are suddenly silenced and they have no need for anything anymore. You can find the place, if you look deeply enough, finding directions, going down false paths, but if you persist you can find it, and the town that rests just below the gaping moor of trees. Don't try to ask them about it, or you'll receive a cold shoulders and blank stares. If you're feeling particularly curious, you can take a stroll through those woods. The route's some of the most scenic that the northeast part of the United States has to offer. Tall trees, coastal plains, and even biking lanes. It feels virtually indistinguishable from any other tourist attraction. When the air gets colder and the sky surrounding gets darker, however, you may want to turn back. Just make sure to keep to the right paths, and try not to stay out of the light. And above anything, try to leave the woods before night, before you can hear any strange noises. You don't know what's out there, watching, waiting. And once they have you, they're not going to be able to let you go. On October 2nd, 2023, British zoologist and YouTuber Scott Pye went missing whilst on vacation in Orlando, Florida. He was reported missing by the State Park Authority at 5 p.m. after he failed to return his kayak at the allotted time. His family also reported him missing later that same evening after being unable to get in contact for several hours. He was visiting the popular tourist destination and nature reserve, Wekiwa Springs State Park. Described as a chatty and enthusiastic man, park staff that spoke to the ecologist mentioned he seemed confident in the wild, despite this being his first time in such an environment. One member of staff also stated that he was very excited to see the gators up close, and even asked us about the chances of seeing coyotes and bears. I've never seen a tourist his age so eager when we said it was possible to encounter a bear. According to the corroborated reports by the family and park staff, the man spent roughly an hour swimming in the spring area before renting a kayak and venturing out alone onto the Wekua River at approximately 11 a.m. He would not return. After extensive searches by the authorities, his kayak was found scratched and dented caught on a log floating over 20 miles away upstream in the St. John's River. While Scott himself was absent, what was found on board was his backpack and some food and water, shoes, car keys, and his smartphone. After managing to break into his phone, police were able to recover multiple audio recordings detailing events as they transpired. These recordings were originally sent to a friend group on WhatsApp, although many failed to send. It has been suggested this was due to him losing cell service at the time, which also explains why he was unable to contact his family or the authorities later down the line when things started to get strange. What you are about to hear are allegedly those same audio recordings, leaked to the public by an unknown source. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey dickheads. Like, I know this isn't usually a thing, um... But, you know me, I like nature, you're my friends, I want to share stuff I like with you guys, so... Yeah, I'm heading out to a place called Wekiwa, or Wekiva, I don't know, it's spelled different ways, I've seen it multiple times, different spellings, whatever. Uh, but this, I don't know, if you guys ever want to come out to the States together, this is like, the best. This is the best thing the Yanks do. State parks, national parks, every single one I've been to so far, absolutely lovely. Where was I last time? Um... 
Itchitokni. I went swimming in Itchitokni, you know, when I went on that date. So, so nice. Freezing? I mean, you wouldn't expect it because we're in Florida and you expect everything to be warm. But even for me, it, it was really, really cold. But, you know, once you get in, you get used to it. I'm hoping this place is similar. It's also a spring. Um, but apparently the water's a lot clearer. There's a lot of nice things to see. So I'll, I'll take pictures, I'll post them as well, because even though you say, you know, oh, it's just a turtle or something, it's pretty. Everyone likes pretty pictures. Anyway, I'm going to stop breaking the law, and I'll message you guys when I get there. Kiss, kiss. Around 15 minutes later, Scott sends a picture of the spring area, showcasing the crystal water and two swimmers that are currently swimming. So I've had a little bit of a walk around, and, I mean, you've seen that picture, right? There's nothing like this in the UK. Absolutely stunning! Anyway, there's a sign over here I'm gonna send you a picture of, give me a sec. There's bears around here. Less than a minute later, Scott sends a picture of the bear aware sign detailing what to do when encountering a black bear. Man, how cool is that that they have bears here? Like, I, I know bears can be dangerous, and I'm not exactly going to go up and, like, stroke on the head. But, I mean, these, at least, these are black bears. And these guys, I've seen them get scared away by cats on the internet, so, I mean, I think I can do it. Not that I'd want to, I'm not going to harass the wildlife, but to just be in a place that actually has wild predators, like bears, that's just, that's really cool. And it's so close to where people live, too. Man, I'm jealous. Shortly after this, via text, Scott and his friends engage in a little banter. Them claiming he's going to be eaten by bears, him agreeing, and asking what everybody would like of his belongings once he's gone. Alright, you bastards. Okay, Yusuf, you can have the Steam account. Connor, obviously you want the League of Legends account. You don't even have to ask. I know how much you love that game. Uh... But no, none of you are getting the dogs. I don't trust you with them. I'm gonna go for a dip, and, you know, in a bit, I'm gonna go in a kayak. Approximately an hour and a half later, Scott sends a picture of him in his kayak, followed by a short video of him enjoying his surroundings. So it's my last day here, in the beautiful state of Florida, the only state that British people go to, and I am on a kayak. I'm gonna try and film some beautiful wildlife if I can. Already see some turtles, been swimming in the swimming area over there. Now we're gonna go somewhere that's a bit more dangerous, so you can't swim legally. And I ain't gonna break that law. <laughs> but let's see if we find something cool. Okay, yeah, I'm doing it in a, like a documentary style, because maybe I'll use the same footage later. Alright? Scott reacting to a comment from one of his friends. This is honestly paradise. I know this is kind of just like holiday vibes and you know, maybe it's the vitamin D from the sun that I'm finally able to access now I've left the UK for a bit. But my god, this is just, it's just my jam. This is what I was made for. I was made for nature and now I'm, I ha actually have access to it. This is awesome. Uh, uh, there's some people coming up around the corner, so... Uh, blah, blah, blah. So this is my view. For those of you that haven't come to Florida, it has the second highest population of American alligators in the world, I believe, after either Louisiana or New Orleans. Not entirely sure. My feet, look at them. Yeah, did you want better and send you a video of my feet? <laughs> okay, yeah, I know it was weird, but you know. That's comedy! Haha! -ha. Right, um, so, so I don't flood the chat with videos of me being stupid, I'm just gonna send stuff of, like, when I encounter actual wildlife or cool scenery. So, uh, BRB, whilst I have the internet. This is a night heron, and I'm slowly drifting in its way. Oh shit. It's 
So, so far, been out here for around 10 minutes. I've seen one alligator at a distance, and it was a, a smaller one, so it went under the water away from me, even though I was trying to be very stealthy approaching it. They're too good, very well aware of their environment. They are the apex predators here. And I am just a visitor. Scott then begins an argument with one of his friends in the group chat. Now, alright, look. You can't call a human really an apex predator. Trophically speaking, humans are mesopredators. They eat and are eaten by other things. At least, you know, in a natural setting. I, I know guns are tools and, you know, whatever, people can make them, but you know, it's cheating. You, there's, you look at it, it's cheating. So yeah, the alligators and maybe the black bears, but I think the alligators eat them too. They are the apex predators in this ecosystem. Humans are just, you know, apes that learned how to hack the system. You don't agree with me, I'm an ecologist. I win. So right now we have an alligator. There we go. Just basking on that log. This is either a juvenile male or a smaller female. Look at that. Or it could be a juvenile female. <laughs> Look at that animal. That is a beautiful creature right there. Don't want to get too close because we don't want to spook them back into the water. They recognize us as a threat. That's one of the main reasons that they don't go for humans very often. This one's small. Much smaller than me, so... You wouldn't even think of attacking. Hello. I am drifting, but not intentionally getting closer. This is a bit of the flow of the river. Hey, aren't you beautiful? Look at you. I suppose you can't. Don't have a mirror. But you are absolutely stunning, sweetheart. Absolutely stunning. Guys, I can't believe I'm chilling next to an alligator. This is the best. I've seen them before, but, you know, like, I'm, this is just me in the wild with an apex predator. Now, I know she's, like, small, or he, I, you know, I can't tell. Oh, it's so awesome. I couldn't even do this with a fox in the UK, man. This is just sad. You know, I'm going to enjoy this whilst I'm here, and I'm going to stop complaining for five minutes, because, you know, it's a national sport in the UK. But I'm not in the UK, I'm in Florida, I'm in Florida, 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 okay. What would a Floridian do near a gator? Come on, honey, I'm gonna wrestle you! <laughs> okay, no, alright, that was bad. Uh, I'm just gonna admire her for a bit. I'm gonna spam the chat with videos. So the American alligator, at one point, if you can believe it, was bordering on extinction. But thanks to amazing efforts done by the American people, not only is the species saved from extinction, it is thriving today. Yes, I do intend to be the next David Attenborough, thank you very much. But no one can really fill his shoes. You, deer? Maybe? But, I don't, nice! I can't believe I got that. I don't see anything, but that was sick. This is the first time that Scott encounters it. As no formal name has been given to the creature, and he has identified it as possibly a type of deer. As we'll see soon, it was not a deer. Okay, I know I've been spamming for like two hours now, but I'm gonna keep going. I wanna go closer to the whatever that was, but it's on land, so I can't exactly do that. I'm just gonna hope I hear it again. But I do think I see another alligator coming up, so enjoy those videos. So here I am, next to an American alligator, respecting its distance because that's what you have to do around predators. Don't mind me just crashing into a bush. Even though it is much smaller than I am, it can still take your arm off. Not that it would, because these are otherwise known as swamp puppies. That chill. Hope you have a wonderful day. Get plenty of vitamin D. 
don't get too cold when you get back in the water. Yeah, so I'm just going to chill and enjoy the scenery for a bit now instead of just spamming you guys. I'll see you guys on my way back because I don't know if I'm going to keep my signal. But yeah, I'll be safe. That alligator was bigger than last, but you know. Oh, I'm bigger and stronger. Okay, I'm bigger, but I don't know. Don't know about that second part. After this point, Scott posts the odd video of the surrounding area. Approximately an hour later, he attempts to send more audio messages. They do not go through. Got the sun and the rain. We're just going over a large school of, I think, tilapia. Look at those little guys. Log. Other log. A plethora of life. This is in a section where I am standing. What a beautiful place. You know, I'm really surprised by the amount of people I've met on here. I've seen at least 17 people. Now, okay, I don't know. I'm bad with numbers, you know me. But I've seen a ton of people here. Like, this this is wilderness. This feels like wilderness, but there are, there are people every so often. Most of them are coming back on me, and I don't know, I, I'm just not great with com conversation. Autistic, don't you know? But, um... Yeah, it's interesting. I'm going to take the path less traveled. Coming up on a pair of terrapins here, two different species by the looks of things. I don't know if that's a painted turtle on the left. And this is a yellow belly slider or a river cooter. They're very similar animals, many in the same genus. Sorry, I'm trying to steer away so I don't disturb them. But I do actually have an American species in my back pond in the UK. It looks awfully similar to this little one. Mine was a abandoned pet. They're quite commonly abandoned in the UK, which is such a shame. Whereas their natural habitat is here. Oh, something splashed. In places like Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, stuff like that. It's amazing they can even survive in the cold water of the UK. But some manage. Well, I'm being taken towards this uh, dead end. A tree is providing a bridge for potential wildlife. A potential bridge for wildlife, I should say. But, I'm snagged on this log right here. So, I'm gonna turn around. Whoop. I can take off a lot of animals from my list since I've been here. Like, I haven't seen the bear, I haven't seen the, I haven't even seen a coyote, which is supposed to be like all over the states. But I saw my number one, saw the alligator. So that's awesome. I mean, this state's supposed to have mountain li- It's mountain lion? <laughs> Jesus, that's close. And they definitely have deer- Weird ass deer, but you know, I think they- they don't have elk that far down. This far down. Yeah, I, I don't know. I know more about European species, but still, that's really close. Anyway, I'm gonna stop rambling, because I'm gonna get eaten by the boogeyman soon. Obviously. Fuck it, okay. I am gonna, I am gonna get a little further away from that, because that's weird. Jesus, shut up! So I am now going down a stream. Look at that. I don't have to do anything, and I'm going fairly quickly. Not bumping into too much. This truly is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Now, a lot of the TV shows that we get in the UK, Europe, they make fun of Florida as like, oh, this is a crazy place. Why would anyone go there? It's where old people retire, it's where people bite you. <laughs> it's weird. But is this is genuinely one of the most beautiful places in the world. I mean, look at this. It may be a semi-hostile environment if you're just out in the wilderness on your own, without a kayak, and I'm not gonna 
sugarcoat it. An adult alligator, uh, mountain lion or black bear, they could easily kill me. But that's the thing. If you respect the wilderness, oh, one-handed, let's go. <laughs> and you know how to be in this environment, you're always going to be safe. I just wish we had something like that in the UK. And that's not to say we don't have any beautiful rivers or lakes in the UK, we definitely do. And obviously, since this is near the equator, or a lot nearer, it's tropical, subtropical, there's a lot more biodiversity in general in those places, so that's a bit unfair of a comparison. But even still, we are a very homogenous country because we are unwilling to rewild it, to return places, spaces, to nature. And we can... We can get a lot back, if we give back. It's hard to put into words the amount of joy I feel just drifting down this blissful stretch of river. Just knowing I'm in proximity to animals like bears, alligators, turtles, all these beautiful living creatures. There's no replacing that with concrete and sheep. Just vibing by an alligator. Enjoying the water on your toes, big guy. Ah, I want to be an alligator in the Everglades or... Well, this is a spring. Okay, that alligator just scared the crap out of me. So as soon as I stopped filming, it just shot into the water. It like shat it, so what? It shat itself, I shat myself. I didn't do anything, I didn't even move, but bloody hell, my heart, Christ. <laughs> That might be why. My finger slipped. I, I've always, always, I think it's every zoologist, ecologist, whateverologist's dream to find a new species. I have never heard anything that sounded like that, except maybe a deer. But never a deer that sounds like that. Maybe it's got some sort of like disease, or it's like a male in must. I, I don't know. I don't know every single species in the world. Sue me. But uh, I'm going to start heading back, just in case that's the boogeyman. An hour later before Scott tries to send his next message. I have been trying to find my way back for a fucking hour, and I think I took way too many wrong turns. I'm really stressed out. Google Maps isn't even working, because I'm pretty sure when I look at it, it's taking me the wrong way. Well, not... I mean, there's no sat-nav here, but you know what I mean. Like, it, it hasn't got my correct location. And those noises... There, see? They're still there. It's really loud. It's freaking me out. I'm trying not to panic, because when you panic, you you put yourself in danger, and it's really annoying. So I'm just using this as some form of communication to make me feel a little better during this stressful scenario. You're going to all call me a pussy, but I don't give a fuck. Right, okay. See you soon, once the internet gets... Once the internet gets through, you loud bastard, shut up! I'm losing daylight. I see the sun starting to descend in the distance. I don't like this. This ain't great. I swear I followed every single path that I took the same way. In reverse order. This is some bullshit. I don't like it. It's bullshit. This place is bullshit. It's beautiful, but it's bullshit. It's around this time that he attempts to call 911. Unfortunately, his signal was not picked up, and he couldn't make his emergency call. But that would prove to be the least of his worries. I can't fucking believe what I've just done. I've dropped my fucking phone. The camera is smashed, and it's going to be expensive. But that, again... Uh, I'm pretty sure I've just been bit by a snake. Like, a really bad snake to be bitten by as well. I was floating along, just splashing a bit too much, maybe. And, um... Oh, this really starting to hurt. I think it was a, a cotton mouth. I don't know. I've never seen one before. But its mouth was white. 
and it bit me and it hurt and it was swimming in the water and where else are you going to find a fucking cotton mouth? Oh god, that really, really fucking stings. Oh. Oh, fuck me. Fuck it, I I've decided I am not staying in the water overnight. I've been bit by something that loves the water and... I think alligators become more active during the night around here. I don't know. I don't know. The reptiles, they shouldn't. Oh, my leg is starting to swell up. I, it's the only thing I can think of. If I walk in a straight line somewhere, I'm sure I'll be fine. Maybe. I swear I've just seen it. I swear I, just, I don't know if I'm just getting delirious from the bite or being stressed. But, I swear to God, I just saw whatever's making that noise. I really don't like this. I don't want, I really don't want to die. I, surprise, surprise, I don't want to die. I'm doing my best to stay quiet, but you need to hear this. This is, it's walking on like two legs. Did, I, I, my, my finger slipped off the thing. Did you hear that? It sounded just like a guy. That sounded like a man. That was a man, right? That was a human being. I hope I get the chance to listen over to this. Listen over this. Listen over this. Fuck, that was way too loud. I need to, need to slow my breathing because that venom is going to go up into my brain really, really quick. It has to. It, it, That's definitely getting closer. That's definitely closer. I have to shut up. I need to shut up. Why can't I stop? Why can't I shut up? Why can't I shut up? Why can't I shut up? I, shut up? I think... I think I lost it. But I can barely walk. And my heart really, really fucking hurts. I can hear the water again. I mean, you're never too far away from it here, and... These frogs are so loud. <laughs> I would love this otherwise. If w I don't know what I'm seeing. I'm probably just delirious. I am... Otherwise... I'm going insane. Because I keep thinking I'm seeing like a man standing there. But it's... It's not like a normal guy. I, it, you know when someone shouts, they like, tense up? Whenever those noises are coming out, it's like he just rips open the top of his head, you know, like a Pez dispenser type thing, and those just spew out. Oh, I feel like I'm gonna be sick. I think I'm back at my boat. I... <coughs> 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 I've been moving around in circles, I guess. I mean, when one leg's working, the other's not, I guess you just know that's how it goes. Maybe the boat is better. Maybe an alligator would be better than whatever that is, because... Even if it's my brain, I... D I would rather be gone and eaten by an alligator by... By an alligator, by an alligator... But whatever. I'm just gonna get in the boat. Fuck it. <laughs> it's it's too it's changing tactic. <laughs> Fuck you, you cunt. I'm just drifting. I'm drifting. I I think this venom's gonna get me. It's really hurting. I just... Oh, I want... I've sent a message to my mom. Saying I love her and my family. You guys... I, I, you love, I, I love you, you know that, right? <laughs> you know my voice. <laughs> <laughs> uh. 
This is so stupid. I'm so fucking stupid. I can barely press this. And the battery's going. I just. Oh no. It's right there. It's it, it's tearing at me. Please. Let the battery show me, please. Not that thing, please. Please, whatever, anything else. No! 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 These were the last of the recordings. No strange attacks by any animals in the area have been confirmed. Have ever been recorded in the area before. The strangest thing yet, although all his belongings were left here on the boat to be found weeks later, a man going by the name of Scott Pye and fitting the description did reunite with his family and board a plane back to the United Kingdom. Authorities are allegedly still trying to get in contact with the rest of his family. Hello everyone, Nature's Temper here, just reminding you that we have t-shirts. If you want to support and show your love for the channel, look in the description below. There you will also find a t-shirt design called Bring Back the Wolf. All proceeds of this design go directly to the Rewilding Institute, a charity that I fully support.